All right. It says that we are recording. Guys, let's just jump into this right now. Welcome back to the Hush Life podcast. It has been a moment. We have not been very consistent with this podcast, which we are going to be hopefully changing. We want this to be consistent. We actually just took a poll yesterday. We put a vlog up, and uh, Logan proposed the question, if it's possible, if it's feasible, would you guys want us to not only have the audio from these podcasts, but the video as well? And I just read through uh, the comments on the vlog that we put up, and it was an over... Yeah, everyone wants a video and audio. Absolutely. Whoa. Oh, sorry. Getting ahead of yourself there. <laughs> I A couple things before we start this podcast. Uh, welcome back. Like I said, we are going to try to be more consistent with this thing. Um, we need your guys' input, though. Like, who do you want us to have on this podcast? Uh, we are going to video it from not today, obviously. You're just listening to it. But in the near future, we are going to video it and audio it. So if you want to watch it on YouTube, it will be there. If you just want to listen to it. Uh, you can go download it wherever you download all of, all of your favorite podcasts. So, moving forward, that's the plan. Also, what I want to say before we jump into this, I don't know if you guys have been living under a rock or not, but we have recently launched our brand new Hushin app. We have been talking about launching an app for a long time, and it has finally happened. We worked really hard on getting this app ready. We wanted it to be... Uh, next to perfect before we launched it and we felt like we got it there and we have launched our app so if you have not yet go to wherever you download apps you can uh, download it for your apple devices you can download it for your android devices and uh, you can download our app and the reason why you want to download our app there's three big reasons in my head why you should download the app shopping if you have got on our website in the past and purchased um, some products hats shirts stickers whatever it might be the shopping experience on our app is way better. It's way faster to get on there, find you a couple things that you want, and check out. It's it's just faster experience. It's a better experience for, for you looking to, to buy some Hush gear. Also, in the future, we are going to do app-only giveaways. So that means we've done giveaways in the past where you've either gone to our store and purchased something, uh, you're a member of our SMS VIP list, where you signed up in the past, and at, you know once you're signed up, you're always signed up, and we've done giveaways that way. We are going to do app-only giveaways, so the only way you are going to be able to win is if you have the app downloaded. Also, my favorite reason why I think you should download the app is because it's going to allow us to do exclusive content. What that means is, in the past, years and years ago, when YouTube wasn't so uh, political on things, we were able to show the whole process. So we could go out hunting, kill an animal, go up there, quarter the animal up, butcher the animal, show all that process as a how-to videos or, you know, just showing you how how we take care of an animal. Well, anymore, YouTube doesn't like that. And if we try to do that, they either demonetize our videos. So not only are we not getting paid, but they're not going out into the algorithm. So even if you're a subscriber, you might not get those videos fed to you. Anyways... Long story short, with this new app, we're going to be able to do that exclusive content again. We're going to be able to put up butchering videos, how-to videos, all those things that we want to do and teach you guys and you guys have asked for. So that's going to allow us to do that. So if you haven't yet, make sure you go and download the Hushin app now. Like I said, you can download it at wherever you download your apps. So anyways, moving forward, uh, got a special guest on today. Uh, Typically, I would say what episode this podcast is. I have no idea it's been that long. Probably like 28, 29, 30. I don't know. Anyways, today I have my beautiful wife, Kaylee, on the podcast with me today. It's just me and her, and we're going to ham it up. We, uh, If you haven't yet, uh, her very first hunt video, well, her very first hunt, which we were fortunate enough to video, just went live on the channel uh, last week, and it is called, do you know what it's called? experience experience so she uh we'll dive into that but yeah so if you haven't go and check out the video experience that is kaylee's very first time ever hunting and uh it's some of the best in my opinion i'm a little biased but it's some of the best content i think we've ever created in the sense that not only it was my wife's uh first time hunting i really just feel like we captured the 
story of a first time hunter going out. And obviously that's what we're always trying to do is capture uh, content in a way that if you guys at home have been through it, if you've taken somebody out for the first time, or if you haven't and you're looking to do it, that you can relate to that story. So you've either experienced what we experienced or you can kind of expect, watch what we did and expect to maybe experience this, uh, you know, a hunt the same way. Anyway, I want to dive into that. Uh, Kaylee's opening her piece tea right now. Go Sorry. ahead, babe. It's okay. Um, we're going to dive into that. But first, I want to kind of talk about our history with YouTube. Hmm. I've told uh, my part of the story many of times on podcasts, on this podcast. And, you know, Eric and Brian have told their stories of, like, how we all came together and how this kind of thing became a career for us. But moving back, like, even further, um, let's talk about Hush and not even about Hush. Let's talk about YouTube in general mm -hmm. at first. So do you remember exactly when all this craziness started? Yeah. Hold on. <clears throat> do you guys edit these? Nope. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard to... Obviously, I remember when we started, but it's hard to explain how it all started without going back even even farther than that you know um because years before we started youtube we were both working s so many hours not spending a lot of time together when casey was home i would work extra and um when he was home he was always wa watching the the hunting channel and i remember I remember having a conversation with him and, and you were talking about doing something in the hunting industry, but it seemed impossible almost. Like how do you how do you get your own T V show? You talked about maybe possibly guiding because you had such a passion for hunting and not a lot of time to do that, right? Yeah, I think um so back <coughs> in the day, me and Kaylee have been married for nineteen years now be 20 in August but uh when we got married I was I was just kind of worked blue collar jobs obviously I did excavation um when we first got married well mm -hmm. yeah it doesn't matter <laughs> I was doing <laughs> excavation uh Kaylee was going through hair school beauty school mm -hmm. um when we were first married and then she graduated beauty school I ended up getting a job later on at the steel mill uh we had great jobs like mm -hmm. our careers were, were were dialed Kaylee obviously you can speak to this more, but you were doing what you've always, what you always wanted yes, to do, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think knowing that you had this passion to do something in the hunting industry was hard because I was, I was doing exactly what I wanted to do. I was grateful every single day that I was able to go and do something that I was passionate about. And I wanted that for you. But it, like I said, it just seemed like how, how could that ever, how could that ever be? Well, what so. Did you do? Yeah, Kaylee was cutting hair. That's, you know, I remember her telling me that's all she ever really wanted to do growing up was cut hair, do nails, work at a, a beauty. What's it, what's it? I just wanted to do that. That I have always loved creating. And I remember you saying, like, what other, what is, what is your hobby? And I was trying to explain to you, this is my hobby. It is like my craft. It's how I create things because it's more than just cutting hair. It's color placement. It's, you know, all those things. And so... It was my hobby. It's, I mean, I still love it. I don't do it as a job anymore, but I still love when I have the opportunity to do it. Yeah, so Kaylee was cutting hair, doing, um, she had built up a clientele base, which um, if any of your wives or significant others work at a beauty salon, you know it takes a while to build up a client base. Um, and she was doing well. She was crushing. She was working a ton of hours, obviously, um, especially we lived in a small town. So friends and family would like to... Uh, take advantage of of late no, nights I uh, mean, it's the truth well I, mean, I liked it too yeah but yet you were working all sorts of hours yeah, and I, I as well like I was working right. at the steel mill and you know the steel mill is an absolute phenomenal job mm -hmm. like the career path they give you if you can get a job there and you work hard I always knew like I never wanted to go to college for whatever reason mm -hmm. I never thought that was like in my in the cards for me I always knew that I could work hard and mm -hmm. I could just I knew how to like do the job and please the people above me and so when I got the job at the steel mill, um, you know, my father-in-law, Kaylee's dad, had worked there since 
she was three, four. Know. Younger than that. So, you know, Kaylee saw her dad work at the steel mill, and she knew what, what that meant. You know, it was long hours. It mm-hmm. was not the greatest hours. It's not the greatest environment, but it definitely provides. It provides right. for your family. It has great pay. It has great benefits. Um, scholarship opportunities for your kids, like all those great things that you were, you're looking for mm-hmm. in a job, m- what most people are looking for. And so I was good. I was working at the steel mill. Kaylee was cutting hair, um, crushing it. And, uh, you know, we were making obviously enough money to, to take care of our family and, uh, you know, plan for the future. But there was definitely something that was missing. Like there was yeah. times that, you know, our kids were at babysitters because you were at your job. I was at my job and you know, that lasted for, you know, X amount of years. And there's nothing, nothing bad about this. Like that's sometimes what is required out of parents is that their kids have to be watched by other people. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think you, I think a kid grows probably more in that scenario than being at home with mom and dad all the time. Yeah. In my opinion, but it wasn't something that we were loving. I don't think. I just think it's interesting because when we had the opportunity or I feel like when we decided just to go for it, we were both at a point that we did feel like there was more. As much as I loved my job, I remember like I was I was just turning 27 and I thought, is this is this it? Did I like this is a goal I set for myself to have a job I love, to work hard, to build a clientele did I just reach that at this age? And I remember thinking, what could I do to further this, this path? Do I go and teach hair? Do I, you know, what do I do? I didn't know. And so I feel like everything just lined up in a way that it made sense to go for it with YouTube. Yeah. So a little, uh, history, you know, we and Kaylee were, were living in Northern Utah at the time. Um, that's where her family's from. It's actually where my mom's family's from as well. Uh, we were working full time, obviously doing the steel mill thing, doing the cut in the hair. I say cutting the hair, but there was so much more involved. Like, would you call yourself a beautician? Yeah. yeah. She was styling hair, cu- coloring hair, cutting hair, nails, mm-hmm. facials, all those things. So she was very well-rounded beautician. Anyway, um, and we were doing well. Like life, we I felt like at the time, like we had life, you know, by the balls. Mm per se. <laughs> the, the issue I always had, which, you know, going back, I said, I knew how to work hard. I knew how to get the job done. I knew how to please those people above me. And the struggle I always had, though, was doing that for a long period of time. Right. For years and years and years. And like before that, I was pretty young. I'd work at a place for a couple of years, two or three years. You know, I worked at a, a restaurant here when I lived in in Idaho in high school. I was a, a dishwasher at first. Then I became a pantry cook. And then broilers assistant and I did that for three years uh had a paper out before that for three years uh when I moved to Utah I worked at a trailer repair place worked on tra- trailer houses did that for three years uh sold pest control for two summers and then we got married and so it's like okay now it's time to like settle down and really get a career yeah because we got married and then pregnant four months later <laughs> yeah we were married <laughs> I remember thinking um this is wild I was ni- I was 22 and Kaylee was 19 mm-hmm. when we got married. And I remember, like, days before the wedding thinking, holy crap, this is pretty, like, are we old enough to be doing this? We were not. <laughs> but in my head, I remember justifying it, thinking, like, wondering, like, are we old enough to be doing this? And then I thought, well, with her 19 years on this earth and my 22 years on <laughs> earth, we've together been here on this earth for 40, 41 years. We've seen a lot of things. We, we're, we're definitely ready to do this. And in my head, that's how... Uh, I just, you know, not justified it, but I was like, that made me feel better. Like, oh, we're good. Yeah, that's hilarious. And, you know, the culture we grew up in, that wasn't out of the norm by any means. Well, and we had dated for three years. Yeah. Three plus years. Which is an eternity in high school. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, also, we were like, we'll get married, but we're not going to have kids for at least four years. Oh, I remember your dad made me, like, promise him that we wouldn't have (laughs) kids. Because Kaylee's parents were very young. You know, you start this uh, cycle with your grandparents per se, right? Right. Like I think my grandma was married at 16, probably had kids at 17. So that like generations down, like everything's like, everyone's pretty young. Yeah. Right. And so when we got married, I was 22. I think Kaylee's mom was 35. I don't, she, yeah, she was, I remember. Yeah. She was like, but so they were very young, but I remember her dad was like, all right, you can marry my daughter, but 
do not have kids. I'm not ready to be a grandpa. Yeah, he said, don't make me a grandpa before I'm 40. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to blame anybody. My finger's pointing definitely at somebody right now. But Me? Uh, hello? What? We, uh, <laughs> we got pregnant right after we got mar- married, four, like four months after. Four months, yeah. Had, had Braley uh, the following September. So 13 months after we got married, we had Braley, which is a complete blessing. Um, right. I'm not saying, you know, like, but at the time, like looking back now, I'm like, dude, we were kids. Well, especially now that Braley's 18. Yeah. If she wanted to get married next year, I would say absolutely not. That's what's <laughs> wild about it. Yeah. If you look at it that way and say a year from now, Braley, or not even a year from now, like right. six months from now, you're going to be married. Wow. Mm. Not happening. Anyway, but so we got married and then it was like for time for me to like settle down and find a, a career path. And luckily I, uh, from some friends, from Kaylee's parents, their friends um, owned a construction business, an excavation business. I knew nothing about excavation. I uh, got hired on. And again, like when I got hired on, I loved the boss. Probably my best boss, the best boss I've ever had yeah. to date, Clayton Grover it was just the guy I needed. Mm-hmm. He's a guy a lot of a lot of people need, but he was the, by far the very best boss I've ever had. And so when I got that job, and a couple of years in, I started learning some different skills. I got my CDL, started driving truck. Uh, shortly after there, I started running equipment, running a track hoe, digging basements, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. But again, it was a lot of work. Yeah. In the summers, you know, we were allowed to work basically as much overtime as we wanted. This was like definitely back in the early 2000s when the housing boom was going on, and so we were allowed to work basically as many hours as we wanted in the summer. And I remember putting in 60, 60 to 70 hours a week in the summer, which doesn't allow for a lot of time at home. Right. But it was a great, great uh, career path. It t- taught me a lot of skills, and it was paying the bills. Like, it was mm-hmm. – I got paid well through doing it, especially when I was working all those hours. And then the opportunity came up to go get a job at Nucor, which – it's kind of a funny thing, like back then especially, it was very hard to get a job at the steel plant. Right. And you kind of, everyone kind of knew the people that worked at the steel plant because they made a lot of money. Mm-hmm. They did really well for, and you know, majority of the guys don't have college degrees, anything like that. They just were blue collar guys, worked their butts off, knew how to get jobs done. And uh, they made some really fantastic steel and they got paid well for it. And so I had the opportunity to go work there. And that was probably one of the harder decisions um, at that point in my life was do I quit the best boss, the best job I had ever had, doing something that I really enjoyed doing, or going to this corporation, basically, you know, and uh, getting all those corporate benefits like, you know, insurance. You know, and we had insurance at, at the excavation place, but like, you know, scholarships, stuff like that, that further on down the road when your kids get older might be super important. And, you know, obviously got paid a little better, and I made that decision to go to the steel mill. Yeah, I also think a decision or something that played a part of that decision was we wanted to have another kid and just feeling the need to increase our income. Yeah, I mean, it's when you're young and you think um, I can we I think I can speak to this now looking back and having four kids now and Two of them, like, we, our kids are kind of spread out. Like, mm-hmm. I almost say, like, two different generations yeah. of kids. You know, we got Braley and Gage, who Braley's 18. Gage is 14 going on 18. Mm-hmm. But then we have our two younger ones, Winston, who's eight, and Layla's five. But uh, looking back, you know, you, in your head, when you're having kids or when you're getting ready to have kids, money is always the biggest issue. Right. Um, it's always, like, how do we make more money? Um, you know, we've got to be able to provide for these kids. we got to, you know make X amount of money a year, whatever it might be. And, uh, and so that's what we were going through at that time. Mm -hmm. Like, Hey, we want to have expand our family. And, uh, so I made the decision to go, go to the steel mill, which, you know, looking back, I don't think it was the wrong decision by any means. I worked, ended up working at the steel mill for four or five years. Um, I, I absolutely, uh, loved the job. I loved, uh, what we were doing. Basically, the steel mill just I don't think I've ever explained this exactly it's called it uh I'm gonna get these phrases wrong because it's been so long but uh mini arc for I can't even remember basically what it is it's a steel mill that's just not making steel out of like iron ore or anything it's actually a recycling plant that's taking old scrap metal like old cars dishwashers things of that nature and then recycling them putting them in a big furnace melting them back down into a liquid form molten steel 
and then casting them into big billets where those billets then get go and get ran into like angle iron, uh, channel iron, um, rebar was a big one, mm -hmm. things of that nature. So that's kind of what uh, the job entailed. And I worked up on the on the furnace deck. I worked where we actually took the metal, put it in the furnace, and melted it down. And I loved it. I I mean, it was tough. Like it is a tough environment by by no means. Uh, the hours were were different. It was uh, four days on, four on, four off, um, twelve. So, and they were rotating. So, one week, say I'd go in on a Monday morning at six thirty a.m. Work till six thirty p.m. for four days, and then I'd have four days off, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go back in for my four days, but it was on nights, so you're always rotating. So one week you work days, the next week you work nights from 6.30 p.m. till 6.30 a.m. Um, but those four days off were great. Like, you know, the one, of the, one of the things that we uh, decided when we were pretty young was we both really enjoyed camping. And so uh, we ended up buying a trailer, like the first, probably the second or third year we were married. Mm, yeah. And uh, we'd camp a lot. So on those four days off um, in the summertime, we'd be camping with our friends or neighbors a lot. Yeah, or just the three of us. We went a lot alone. Yeah, me and Braley and, and Kayla. I remember I had a single uh, cab Chevy, mm -hmm. <laughs> short bed. And so Braley was in the middle in her car seat, which I guess is probably highly frowned upon now. Probably, yeah. Was in the middle <laughs> up front and then Kaylee. And we would, dude, we'd haul that trailer from northern Utah to Island Park, uh, go Logan Canyon, we'd go camping all over the place. That was fun. It was fun. And so, like, you know, Steel mill was great. Like it, it allowed me to have my four days off where I could be home with the kids while Kaylee was working. We could be camping or in hunting season. I really liked it because uh, I could take after a few years, I had gained up some, some vacation and I could take four days off and I would literally have 12 days off in a row. Yeah. You could really get after some hunting if you have a full-time job. Anyway, the problem I had though, going back to where all this started 20 minutes ago <laughs> was after about year four or five, I remember driving into the gate um, so you drive through a gate into the plant and you have a card to get you in. And I remember checking, like sliding my card and watching the little gate go up and thinking, how am I going to do this for the next 20, 25, 30 years until I've saved up enough money to retire? And from that moment on, I, I really struggled with that. I really struggled with the idea of going and clocking into the same place every day for the next 20 plus years until hopefully, you know, we had played our cards right and saved up enough money and, you know, invested enough money that we could retire. Yeah. And, you know, I had been given great examples. My father um, is basically an electrical engineer in Pocatello and worked for the same company for 30 plus years. You know, we moved to Idaho when I was like six years old. Um, here I am 41. My dad still works for that company. He's getting ready to retire. Uh, Kaylee's dad was a great example. He worked at the steel mill from he, the ages of basically like 22, I believe, until he's currently still working there, um, 30 plus years. Like I was given great examples of, you know, of just working hard, keeping your head down and uh, going and doing your job. And, you know, you'll be rewarded with good pay and benefits from it. And uh, I was okay with that, but I did definitely struggle with it. Yeah. that thought moving forward after that day. Well, I think also knowing how you are, you need to you need to be outside. You need to be doing something in the outdoors because even if, when, you know, when you get home from hunting or off season, you kind of go a little stir crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, looking back, that's easy to identify now, obviously, right. because you know I'm, I'm gone in the woods a lot, and then when I do get home for a week, I'm like, okay, I need to do something. Yeah, if it's even you know <laughs> a hike or a day skiing in the mountain. Um, fish and whatever it might be I need to get away but at the time like uh, I thought I was I I I think I was spending a lot of time in the woods still yeah you know with juggling schedules and stuff I would always try to if I remember thinking if I had four days off and you know watching kids three days I needed to have one day where I could like go coyote hunting yeah go fish go do something well I think also I don't know if you remember you I remember you basically saying I don't have time for any other hobbies. You like to snowmobile, you like to golf, and you said, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm spending all of my time hunting. Well, yeah, I remember when I got, uh, I liked golfing a lot growing up, and uh, we actually lived right on a golf course, so I golfed quite a bit. And then when we got married, um, golfed a lot. That was, seemed like the natural thing as a married man <laughs> is to 
have the golf hobby. And I remember thinking on a Saturday, I was out there, or a day off, I was out golfing, I was like, man, this is like, this is fun, but I'd much rather be standing in a river. Yeah. And so I gave up golfing. I never really gave up snowmobiling because your dad got me hooked on that. But yeah, I remember thinking, you know, like, you get to that age and you have all these, like, commitments, you start raising a family, like, you have, you have to choose mm-hmm. certain things, obviously. Yeah. But I chose a f- t- fly fishing over golfing at that yeah. time. But anyway, um, so we got to a point where we felt comfortable. We just bought a new house. Um, kind of, like, weird scenario. I was working at the steel mill, and back in, probably had been working there, like, two years you know, so pretty new still, but I think I'd moved up, got another job, a little higher pay. And then the 2007, 2008, uh, like setback or recession, whatever you want to call it, um, the housing demise. That was right after you got hired. It was like a year or two after. Yeah, Gage I think was it was. born in 2008. Well, my memory definitely uh, fails me at times. I had worked at the steel mill for maybe a year. Yeah. And then that had happened. We had bought a house after the first year of marriage we rented a house mm-hmm. um and then uh i was still doing excavation we bought a house and then i switched jobs to the excavate or to the steel mill and uh we decided that we wanted a bigger house right yeah and so we put our house on the market and it sold relatively fast yeah and like in that process like right before the house sold or right while we were putting it on the market like we started to slow down a little bit mm-hmm. like and the steel mill, you'd heard stories of of slowdowns in the past. And I remember her, her dad telling me, you know, this is very citrical market. Like, it goes up and down. You know, be, be, be prepared. And, you know, I went from making X amount of money to almost, like, not doubling it, but pretty close. Yeah. And so what's funny about making a bigger wage, what I learned, if you're not careful, is <laughs> you make a bigger wage, but you have, then somehow you be, have more debt. Right. I'm sure that there are a lot of podcasts that would advise against doing that. <laughs> yeah. But it, th- we definitely fell in that trap of, of you know, say I was making $30,000 more all of a sudden. We spent twenty to $25,000 more on dumb stuff. Yeah. But we got lucky. We got the house on the market and it sold. And I'm like, literally right after it sold is when things like went bad yeah. in the market for everybody. If mm-hmm. you guys remember back to 2007, 2008, the housing market crashed and everything kind of follows that. And uh, construction definitely still follows that. And it still is usually one of the last ones. So we kind of got to watch it happen. And then we were started to get affected. But we'd sold the house. We were going to buy a house. It ended up backing out. And f- luckily, we uh, rented a garage apartment yeah. from Kaylee's cousin. And so it was basically they built a a garage with an apartment above while they were finishing their house or something. Anyway, they just moved into their house. And so we were able to rent that uh, garage apartment, which was a two bedroom. Mm -hmm. Um, So we had two kids at that time, but we somehow everything fell into place for us. Like we sold the house at like the highest we could have sold it. And then the market crashed. And so we sat on our hands for a while and uh, ended up, then, uh, like a year and a half, a year, late, year and a half to two years later, everything was still super cheap. The house that we ended up buying had sat there for about a year and a half, unfinished, mm-hmm. and we ended up deciding like it was going to rebound. And so we bought the house at the lowest we possibly could have bought it at because of the the recession or whatever. And so then we moved into the house, and things got better again. We started working full time. Anyway, that's kind of when we came to this realization that like we're doing well we have a new house we're driving a new pickup new car trailer house uh but we're we're not ultimately like happy with our situation yeah well we didn't have much time together we definitely didn't have enough time as a family and and I I blame myself for that a lot because because of my job I took advantage of the time that you were home and I would work more so I didn't have to pay a babysitter But um, I think that going into the decision to start YouTube, that was the biggest factor for me, was just more time together. Yeah, I think um, ultimately, at the end of the day, it was like the biggest deciding factor for for us was 
you know, and again, I, I have a phrase that no one's ever self-made. And I really stand by that. Maybe there's some people out there that are self-made. I don't know what that means. But to me, like when somebody says you're self-made, like you started this thing. Like you had this idea. You started it. You never had any um, anybody show you the way, any inspiration for anybody else. And I just don't think that's true very very much of the time. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't for us. Right. You know, luckily I had an older brother and his wife that had started doing YouTube um, to back in probably 2008, like when during the little recession. Yeah. And uh, he's, he, my brother started doing a channel, basically a vlog channel, a video diary of him and his wife and their couple kids at the time. And they just their daily lives. They would do funny skits, mm-hmm. things of that sort. And they did, did really well. And so we kind of had seen that path of them. And they, the one thing they had was a lot of time. A lot of time, yeah. Together. They were always together, you mm-hmm. know. And so we had, we were, we had been kind of shown that, that opportunity. And then... Um, you know, Kaylee had always, Kaylee had wanted to do something on, on the YouTube platform. She wanted to do hair tutorials. I, somewhere I still have videos (laughs) of you doing, (laughs) you trying to do a hair or not trying, but you doing a hair tutorial in our bathroom in Garland off like the little flip camera that you'd bought. Uh So Kaylee was like way ahead of me. She like had researched what cameras to buy. Yeah. I remember telling Casey, why aren't we doing this? And I remember you saying, I could never film myself. (laughs) Yeah, I really wasn't that guy. Like, my history of of, of filming was when I was in high school, I was trying to become a professional snowboarder. Mm -hmm. And so, like, from probably, like, my freshman year till, like, I was a senior in high school, we would go and film each other, me and my buddies. And we were using a VHS to film. Mm -hmm. So that giant – it was actually – my mom worked for the school district – and I think it was – at one time it was the schools, and we'd have to check it out. And then I think we ended up buying it from the school or something. I don't know. But it was this giant VHS player or vid- what, film camera. I don't even know what you'd call it. Video camera? Yeah, camcorder. Cam there you go. <laughs> but we would film each other doing these tricks or whatever, and then we'd go home and we'd cut it with two VCRs. So, so you'd have to hook two VCRs up to the TV. One would play – what the con like the content you created it was not called content back then the video you created mm-hmm. or the parts of it and then the other vcr was to record so you would start this one with the with the video uh-huh. and you would hit record on this tape on this and so you that's how you would cut okay so you would put push play and record and then you'd have to know it well enough that when the, you were done recording you would hit stop and so you could can make this little cut up video Mm -hmm. and then send it to sponsors anyway Kaylee was way ahead of me and back then there was these flip cameras yeah they didn't have any memory card or they didn't have any external memory card it was all internal and then it had like usb port thing that would pop out the side of the camera you'd plug it into your laptop and that's how you would uh grab the footage off the camera anyway so i remember her doing that and then it got to a point where my brother and his wife with some other friends from YouTube, started a production company in L.A. I'm going to kind of move through this pretty fast because I've told the story so much. But anyway, like, they started a production company. We had the opportunity to go down there, kind of see it. And then their production company really wanted Kaylee to come be a part of this new channel they were going to start called The Mom's View. Yeah, they wanted to bring, you know, at the time it was, I feel like, a lot of funny videos on YouTube. People didn't really use it as like a search engine or a place to find content outside of funny videos that people were sharing. So they wanted to bring moms to YouTube. So they wanted to make YouTube or mom content on YouTube. Yeah. So at the time, Google uh, still owns YouTube today. They wanted to capture a bigger mom demographic. You know, a lot of moms are stay at home moms and they felt like that was a great way to garnish a, a mom demographic and so they started this channel and they offered Kaylee, like, I remember one of the founders of the company um, was talking to Kaylee and kind of presented her that idea. And, you know, we were in L.A. And, dude, I was such a not a city boy at all, right. <laughs> which was like a new experience for us. I think we were down there in L.A. F- over the 4th of July. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so they presented Kaylee this idea. And my brother was like, dude, you need to do YouTube, like YouTube, YouTube. And I'm like, I don't know. We had started. We had to actually start it. Yeah, we had a vlog that we had been. I didn't even, started yeah, a vlog. I started a vlog, basically, like video, and just doing dumb, dumb things. It was funny. 
It was fun. It, it was fun. You did a good job. It was silly is what it was. Silly. I loved it. Anyway, so long story short, we come back from L.A. and they're like, we had these opportunities. And I didn't even think twice about this. I was like, there's no way. Like, what I know is you keep your head down. You work hard. You, mm-hmm. you know, you work for the man, which is fine. Like, that's, that's okay. And you get paid. You get, you know, you get monetized for your time. And uh, you just, that's how, that's how you live. And we just bought a house. Like, had responsibilities. And I remember telling my brother that. And he's like, you need to quit and do this. I'm like, dude, I can't quit. Like, we just bought, new, like, I have responsibilities. I have a house, like, blah, blah, blah. And I remember we got home, and Kaylee, again, like, it went in my ear and out the other, like, before we even landed yeah. back home. And I remember Kaylee, like, that night or the next day, like, what do you think? I'm like, think about what? And she's like, moving to L.A.? I'm like, it's a pipe dream. No way. Yeah. There's no way. We're, and I literally never even thought twice about it after, you know, leaving L.A. and getting home. And then. And I think for a second I was like, well, I could do both. I can fly out to L.A., do the mom stuff and fly back. Yep. Which, because that was the opportunity, is she was going to be part of this new channel, and they were going to film, you know, a couple times, a couple videos a week. Mm-hmm. And then she was going to start her own personal channel. And uh, I remember her asking me, and I was like, no way. No way. And uh, she, um, there was, w- and then my brother would call me at night when I'd get home from work. <laughs> He's like, dude, what do you think? I'm like, dude, I'm not quitting my job. Like, I have a really good job. It pays well, I have this house, this responsibility, I have kids. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, it slowly just like started creeping in my mind. And I remember one night you were, you asked me again and I'm like, babe, like, what do you really think? Like, cause in my head, honestly, at that time, I never thought in a million years, just knowing like you watching your dad get the job at the, the, the steel mill, be able to provide for your family, give you, give your family everything they mm-hmm. needed, everything they wanted. And you seeing that for X amount of time, you know, 20 plus years, I th- never thought in a million years you'd, you, out of all people, would tell me, like, you should quit that great career yeah. path and do something crazy. Yeah. I know. Mean, I have always been so proud of my dad. You know, I've, I've watched him work so hard, and and now he's a boss. Out, You know, he's he's worked hard. He's worked his way up, and I've been proud of that. And... And I don't even think that I thought about that. You know, I don't know why. I I just think that we were presented with this, and it felt right to me. And they were they said, we don't want you to fly back and forth. We want you here because we want to film every day, basically. So it wasn't going to be just a couple times a week. It was going to be every day. Yeah, and I remember that one night, like, when it finally started creeping in my head, like, man, like, should I really think about this? I remember talking to you and having a deep conversation, a deeper conversation than we have had, than we had at the time. And I'm like, you really think like this is the right thing? And I remember you saying that a couple things that really stuck out and it still stuck out. First thing was that you, it felt right to you. Like the idea of quitting this, quitting both, not just my job, her job. Yeah. Like I had a great job, but she had a great job. She Mm -hmm. worked just as hard as I did and she had worked hard to build up a clientele. Yeah. So you, work a couple of years and work your butt off and do everything your clients want so that they they will come back mm-hmm. right so they're loyal clients yeah i had a lot i had a lot of bosses <laughs> yeah kaylee had lots Basically. of bosses new bosses every day yeah anyway like it wasn't just m- me m- making that decision it was you as well and so you said it felt right which was like stuck deep with me because i'm definitely that guy like kind of run off the cuff like oh if it feels good it must you know mm-hmm. let's go with it and then what you also said is what, like, what's the worst that could happen? Yeah. Like, if this doesn't work out, we move to L.A., like, it doesn't work out. And a year from now, we move back. You get another job somewhere else, and we're, and it's fine. But we've, like, we gave ourselves that opportunity. Yeah. And I think after that, I was like, okay, I'm the guy standing in the way. Well, I think, too, for me, I knew you weren't happy. And I think that when you see someone not truly happy with their circumstances, it's easier to make that decision to try to find something that would make you happy. Yeah. And that's, you know, when you're in like the heat of it, you don't really think about like at that time, you don't, I didn't think of like happy or not happy. I just thought about like what had to happen. Right. What had to take place. And that was just me to show up to work and do my job and, and uh, deal with it. Cause that's what everyone did. Yeah. But I think, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, it weighed really heavy on me that I was doing something I loved so much 
and you weren't. Yeah. Um, and I remember having these conversations with Shay. Yeah. You know, he would come into town and be like, hey, man, like, if you could do – I remember one night he can't. He, like, had flown in from somewhere. He was headed home, but it was super late, so he stayed the night, and we stayed up uh, pretty late talking. And he was like, dude, if you could do anything, like, anything, money wasn't an option, what would you do? And I remember my little brain at the time was like – well, you know, I, I like, I've ran equipment before. I like running equipment. I like playing in the dirt. Like, I probably own a landscaping business. Mm-hmm. He's like, no, dude, honestly, like, anything. I'm like, well, if it was anything, dude, I have a hunting channel on TV. Mm-hmm. He's like, well, why don't you do that on YouTube? And I'm like, well, because that's not what's on YouTube. Anyway, right. moving forward, the reason I wanted to talk about this, because in the film, Experience, I, was, I talk about if it wasn't for you, Kaylee, I don't know if we would be sitting here right now today having this podcast about our, our past, our future, you know, our present mm-hmm. of doing online content. And I really mean that. I think if it wasn't for you, if, if you would have been like, no, it's a pipe dream, I would have been like, yeah, it's a pipe dream. And it probably would have never happened. But since you had w- the vision, the feeling, whatever it was to just say that to me, that's all it took. And I remember after that, after we had that conversation, it was literally the next day, and I was terrified. <laughs> I went into my boss, who I looked up to, a uh, super good dude, and I told him, I said, hey, man, um, because when you get a job at the steel mill, like, people just don't quit that job. Right. They are either, unfortunately, fired for doing something dumb, or they retire. Mm-hmm. And that's just how it is, because it, you know, it pays out well. And literally, there's no job around that you could get paid that well without having some sort of you know, degree. And so I was terrified to tell my boss. And I remember I went and talked to him and he's like, dude, good for you. He goes, man, I've worked here for X amount of years. I love it. It's been a great job, but man, I wish I would have tried something different at one point Mm -hmm. just to try it. And after that, I was like, okay, that, that kind of the warm fuzzy I needed, but you know, I was committed to doing it anyway. It just felt better when I talked to my boss. And then later I had to go and talk to the supervisor I <clears throat> talked to all these people that I looked up to thinking one of them was going to finally be like, you're dumb. You shouldn't do this. <laughs> and, you know, I went to the next guy and he was like, Hey man, good on you. Like, he, and he told me, he said, if, and if something happens, he goes, dude, we love you. Like you'll always have a job with me. I'm like, awesome. Yeah. So then onward and upward, I guess we moved to LA and did YouTube, and um, I told Kaylee, you know, I was doing the vlog channel. She had started her personal channel, and then we moved to L.A., and when we moved to L.A., I told her, I go, I'm going to s- figure out a way. It doesn't make sense at this time because <laughs> we're moving to L.A., but I'm going to figure out a way to do something on in, with hunting content. Mm-hmm. And it was wild, man. Like, we moved there in July, August, August. first of August, like, literally drove in with the U-Haul, um, my brother's production company had us a place to stay, which was awesome because mm-hmm. rent is outrageous there. Yeah. So we had a place to stay, moved in, and the next morning we went and did a, our very first, like, promotional shoot for Foot Locker. Oh, Remember yeah, that? that's right, yeah. And I was just like, wow, this is weird, this is wild. But that was in August. In September, I had made plans to fly home. Cause we, and one other thing I told Kaylee, I go, if we do this, I we got to keep the house. Yeah. Because the house makes me feel somewhat normal if something happens we can come back to our house you know regroup get new jobs like whatever but we have our 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 home Mm -hmm. and so like I told Kaylee I'm gonna fly home and I knew my uncle my dad um Shay a couple other people had drawn tags that year like and I was like oh man like I can just go film these guys as hunts and so I did and I was gone for like a month and a half yeah. like we had been in LA for a month and then I leave for a month and a half like that's pretty scary for it was really a younger scary. mom with two two children who grew up in a town with two stoplights yeah I grew <laughs> up in a town with 3,500 people <laughs> yeah it was really scary anyway that's if you've watched that um that's why I say what I said in that video is if it wasn't for Kaylee we might not be sitting here hush might not be a thing and I truly feel that because you know sometimes in our lives we need a push we need an example we need somebody to help us understand that like we can do things we can do hard things we can try new things we can go outside of the norm and not have to work that nine to five and try this other thing mm-hmm. and really like at the end of the day what what's the worst thing that can happen yeah so moving forward 
I've done Hush now for this is tw- year twelve. Mm-hmm. I started Hush that first year, but I uploaded the first video in November, I believe, of twenty eleven. So that'd be this is year twelve now. Yeah. And Kaylee grew up in a family of hunters. Mm-hmm. Um, fun fact: at one point, Kaylee's great grandpa was the largest landowner, like individual landowner. It's not a corporation, but an individual landowner in the state of Utah. Yeah. And he has a cool story. Um, you want to tell your grand- great-grandpa's story? I feel like you tell it better than me. So Kaylee's grandpa was from Greece. He came over um, from Greece during the uh, big railroad boom, is the way I remember this story being told. So he came over and he worked on the railroad. He was young, like teenager, maybe like early teens. And he worked on the railroad when they were trying to meet the east and the west coast. Um, Golden Spike, which is right where we lived in Tremont. Anyway, uh, he worked on the railroad. And then um, he had experience raising uh, like goats and lambs back at home. Greece is well known for goats and sheep. And so he had experience. So after the railroad thing, uh, he started herding sheep for people, for local ranchers. And uh, when he was doing that, he, instead of taking, I think, I'm sure he took some sort of pay, but instead of taking all of his pay in dollars, he started gaining his own herd. So instead of somebody paying him, you know, a hundred bucks for the summer or whatever it was, they'd give him a couple lambs. Mm -hmm. And so he started building his herd that way. And then... um, homesteading was still a thing back then it was still obviously a giant thing and so he started homesteading some land and uh he brought his brother and his sister i believe over from greece to homestead some land and so they were all homesteading all this acreage up in monte cristo Mm -hmm. and so um don't know how the laws read at the time but if you took care of x amount like your prop this property it it was public property but if you took care of it like used it for X amount of years, it became yours. And so they did that, um, long story short, over the years he worked his butt off, yeah. built up a giant herd of sheep, uh, had a, a giant family, mm-hmm. and uh, had all this land. Anyway, so Kaylee came from a hunting family. They were, yeah. they, you know, her dad hunted that uh, all growing up. He'd kill deer every year. Yeah. You know, they had some awesome properties to hunt back then. Um, so she knew what hunting was, obviously. And then we got married, and I think the very the biggest difference is you guys didn't eat a lot of the wild game your dad harvested. No, we we ate some jerky. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, and that was the very typical thing back then is if you killed a buck, a deer, or whatever, you would just have a jerky. Yeah. And so Kaylee wasn't accustomed to eating, like, wild game, like steaks Never. and roasts and burger. So when we got married, that was kind of, like, what, what was your thoughts well, I also grew up with a lot of people saying, like, ew, it yeah. tastes gamey. And so I, in my mind, I was like, ew, it e- probably tastes gamey. <laughs> even though, which is, this is kind of a funny thing, even though you guys grew up eating lamb, never right. thinking twice about it, which lamb is delicious yeah. if it's cooked right. And her family, by far the best cooks of lamb I've ever had. But um, if you eat mutton, which I'm sure you did, mutton's terrible, <laughs> in my opinion. So mutton's just an old... It's not a sheep anymore, or a lamb. It's a sheep, like an old one. Okay. Which is, a, there's a funny story about that. <laughs> um, but if you get, a, like, a greasy piece of mutton, it's not good at all. But you loved lamb, all yeah. sorts of lamb. Yeah. I remember going to uh, to family reunions of yours, and they would Dutch oven lamb, which mm-hmm. was delicious. And then I remember one day uh, your mom, I think, cooked up some mutton, like, sausage, like breakfast sausage. And I thought it was the grossest stuff <laughs> ever. Anyway, so yeah, she didn't. Gr- you didn't grow up eating a lot of wild game, but you grew up eating a lot of lamb. Eating a lamb that you guys raised yourselves, right? No. Well, that your grandpa raised. Yeah, I, I thought you meant I used to show sheep in the fair. You didn't slit their throats never, and eat them. Never, no. <laughs> so Kaylee would show a, a lamb every <laughs> year in the fair for the 4-H club, which you would have to raise, right? Yeah. And take care of, and then yeah. go and show it, and hopefully it, it wins grand champion. Make some money. Make some money. Clothes. But so while eating wild game was kind of a new thing, and there's a funny story about when we were first married, if you remember, um, we'd gone out, I'd taken, I'd gone out and shot some pheasants. Mm -hmm. And I love (laughs) pheasant. Like I grew up eating a lot of wild game. 
Um, my dad was into it. My mom, not so much. But my dad was into it, and I was into it when I got old enough to, like, learn about it. And we ate a lot of wild game growing up, pheasants, deer, elk, whatever. And so I came home, and uh, I made up some pheasant. And I remember, like, it was – you enjoyed – maybe you had eaten it a time or two. Yeah. But there was one time – do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. When I was watching you clean it, and you were picking the – the BBs out. Yeah. So, you know, didn't make a great shot on a pheasant. It breasted them a little bit. So when you guys know at home, if you shoot a pheasant, like if some BBs end up in the chest, not only do you have to go and retrieve the BBs, you also have to retrieve feathers because when a BB goes through <laughs> the breast of a, a pheasant, it takes feathers with them and embeds them into the breast. Yeah, so that grossed me out <clears throat> but watching you. What happened was you, we ate it and then you bit into a BB. I bit into a BB and <laughs> it almost made me throw up. And that was, like, <laughs> game changer for Kaylee for a number of years. Because I did like pheasant. Casey's a great cook. And I did like the pheasant, and that happened, and just the thought of you cleaning that and... Bleh. she Yeah, she wasn't a fan, and <laughs> I, I made the mistake of, like, not, like, really taking my time and doing a better Casey, job. Casey, that happened twice. Yeah, well, that's what I was going <laughs> to say. Then I finally convinced her years later. I was like, I'm sorry, that was dumb. Like, it won't, dude, I've only probably bit into one or two BBs all my life. It's a thing that happens. And then she bit into another BB and was banned. But she <laughs> learned to enjoy wild game. Uh, maybe not at that time so much. Well, I'm saying over the years. Like, I'm not staying with that. Oh, over friend. the years. Over the years. Like, yeah, I prefer it now. So Kaylee has been exposed to hunting. Is is a pi- picture I'm trying to paint. Like, okay. she grew up knew- knowing what hunting was. Uh, and I, I say this in the way that, when we were moved to LA, we were, I especially was exposed to a different um, mindset. Mm-hmm. So growing up as a hunter, a fisherman, outdoorsman in Idaho, uh, gun owner, gun supporter, all that stuff. Like in my head, growing up in Idaho, because there's no not a lot of opposition, especially back then. Yeah. Here was if you didn't hunt and you didn't own guns, you were against hunting. You're against guns. Mm-hmm. And when we moved to L.A. and I was exposed to people that uh, grew up with a different lifestyle, I slowly understood that not everyone that's not a hunter or doesn't own a gun is against it. Mm -hmm. They just don't understand it. Right. And so when we started uh, the Hush Channel, I definitely quickly uh, understood that because, you know, I'd started this vlog channel, which was the audience was so diverse. Mm -hmm. Um and then when I started the Hush Channel, I converted some of those people from the vlog channel to the Hush Channel. And it was it was a tough sell at first, yeah. to say the least. Right. Because a lot of people uh, didn't grow up the same ways we did. Mm-hmm. They didn't grow up. You know, the only thing they knew about hunting was you were killing animals. Yeah. And the only thing they knew about guns was everything that was negative that was shared on the news. And that's yeah. the only thing. You right. know, their dad didn't own a gun for whatever reason. They didn't see a gun. The only time they ever saw a gun was on the news when there was something bad happening. Yeah, so th- it's scary. That's scary if that's, the only, that's your only exposure to that. Yeah. Where it seemed very normal to us growing up. It was scary to other people. And so, but Kaylee knew about hunting she knew her dad went hunting she understood you know an animal died and you could eat the jerky you could eat the pheasant with a couple of bbs in it whatever it <laughs> might be she understood it and she's been a supporter of hush you know the biggest supporter of hush since i started this thing i mean like on the early years the first three or four years like it was just me and if i could rope logan away like mm-hmm. he graduated high school one year and i took him as my camera guy but <laughs> it was basically me trying to film myself, being an idiot. <laughs> then Logan came and upped the, the film value, the, the cinematography value. But I was gone a lot. Yeah. I was gone a lot. But I think that while I appreciate the credit that you give me, I don't think that I, if I didn't know how hard you worked and if I didn't believe in you after watching your hard work and dedication and knowing your passion for hunting, I wouldn't have been like, yeah, go ahead and do that. But then I continued to watch you work so hard. Well, yeah, I mean, being a not only a stay-at-home mom, but Kaylee is a full-time YouTuber herself. She's a full-time content creator, and she has been just as long as I have, if not longer. So she creates. She has a vlog on her channel. She still runs a, a full-time uh, YouTube video channel, and she does all the social media, all that stuff. So it's not only that she's a stay-at-home mom. She's still doing what I'm doing, just at home. Mm-hmm. So it's not like 
you know, I know how busy I am. Even when I get back from hunts, we're in this office a lot yeah. doing different things. So Kaylee allowing me to go be gone for X amount of time while still juggling kids, while still juggling her career, like all these things has definitely allowed me to, it allowed me to get to a point, you know, four years after I'd started this thing to bring on Eric, bring mm -hmm. on Brian, that had really changed the d dynamic of the business yeah. and has made it a business. Really, it was a hobby at first um, that I was trying to create, but because I, I was still trying to run a vlog too. Yeah. And so the Hush Within Channel was always kind of like a secondary thing. And, you know, living in LA, it's not easy to just get out and film outdoor content yeah. without a lot of planning, a lot of travel. I mean, I, f I feel like it was a lot of sacrifice for both of us. It was a sacrifice for you to stay in LA for me. And it was a sacrifice for me to be taking care of things by myself in L.A., which was scary and new and different. And, you know, I, I feel like I feel like the beginning was just a lot of sacrifice. You know, you being away from the kids, us being away from each other. But but I believed in it like full 100 percent believed in you and believed in what you were doing. Also, going back to, you know, you're talking about your audience and how hard that was. I was, I thought that I knew how passionate you were about hunting, and I thought that I understood hunting, and I quickly realized that I didn't fully understand that until I saw the conversations that you were having with people and how you explained what you were doing and watching them understand. And it was, it was such good communication on your part and theirs because you now understood where they were coming from. They didn't hate all of these things. They didn't understand it. You helped them to understand and you understood where they were coming from. Well, yeah, I think that's the bridge of all of this. And I, I quickly learned that um, when I started uploading videos the first year and trying to, you know, um, push my vlog audience to the, the Hush channel was, you know, at that time, when people didn't understand hunting, it wasn't they were against it. What they understood hunting was, and there's still people like this, that you load up the truck with uh, all your buddies, all your ammunition, all your guns, cases of beer, and you go out in the woods and you drive around and you shoot everything you see and then mm -hmm. you go home. Yeah, what you see on, on movies. Or yeah. And so the bridge is the food, the food aspect of it. And mm -hmm. so immediately after I started uploading videos, I was like, oh, I got to showcase us cooking these these animals to show yeah. people like I'm not just killing things to kill things, but like our, my family like relies on these things. Mm -hmm. But uh, wh what I'm trying to do is walk us down a path of you grew up understanding hunting. You knew your dad went hunting. You knew you could eat the jerky. We mm -hmm. got married. We ate some pheasant, ate some deer. Mm -hmm. You started getting into that, but you'd never been hunting. No. And what you just said was, I remember like showing you, I can't remember what video it was, but like I just got done cutting a video. It took way longer than it should have. <laughs> and I was like pretty happy with it. So I wanted to show my family, you know, Kaylee and the two kids at the time. And I remember you watching it and you were just like, whoa, like, and I remember thinking like, oh, like, sh like, again, this is like speaking to me like, okay, maybe somebody grew up with hunting. So they understand their dad hunts. They understand that it provides meat. They understand all those things but they don't understand actually what all goes into hunting until they either watch a video, but even more so going on a hunt. Yeah. So I've been running the Hush Channel for 11 years. You know, let's talk back to last summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we live in the great state of Idaho. And in the state of Idaho, the um, fishing game allow you. So they, there's draws every year you can put in for draw tags, you know. And there's no, not a point system in Idaho you just put in, and everyone has an equal shot of drawing if you're a resident. And then re non-residents get X amount of tags. But everyone puts in every year and in hopes to draw. You know, you can either choose to put in for a, a trophy, a once-in-a-lifetime tag, so you can either put in for moose, sheep, or goats. Or you can choose to put in for, you know, all your other big game, elk, deer, antelope, bear. And uh, so every year during COVID – I made Kaylee take the <laughs> hunter safety course because during COVID, uh, I think it's still the case today that you can do it all online. Mm -hmm. So you can take the class online, take all the tests online, and then you don't have to go. And at that time, you didn't have to go and do a field day because of COVID. So I was like, this is a great time for you to do it, understand it. Not ever thinking Kaylee would hunt, 
but just for the simple fact of she could put in for the draws, and if she was lucky enough to draw a tag in the state of Idaho as an adult, she can pass that down to one of her immediate children. So if she drew a, draws an antelope tag, she can give that to either Braley, not so much anymore because Braley's 18, so mm -hmm. she's not a child. But in the past, she could give it to Braley or Gage as, like, hand it down to him. And so uh, Kaylee got her hunter safety a few years ago. I started putting her in. And I think actually the first year, uh, people were like, man, how do you guys draw tags all the, every year? Like, it's not fair. It, what I can tell you is I, we put in for every state possible in the West. Well, we have points in almost every state that, allow, that has points. And if we draw, like, one or two tags a year as a family, which that's typical, like, one or two of us will draw one tag, it's not great odds because of the amount of time I put into putting me and Gage in every state and then you and Braley in, in Idaho. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so uh, she drew an antelope tag her very first year and uh, passed it down to Gage. And uh, I think this year was her third uh, – the third year I put her in, I put her in for all the tags – and I went to check the results, and would you know it, Kaylee draws a late-season rifle mule deer tag in Idaho. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Again, like, Braley's drawn a tag like this before where she drew a tag that I've been putting in for all my life, never have gotten it. And then the first year putting her in, she draws it. Same thing with you this year is I put you in for a tag that I've always wanted, never thought it would, was possible, and you draw it. Mm -hmm. And immediately I thought, okay, she's either going to give it to Braley or Gage. Um, Gage had a couple other deer tags. Anyway, like, I had pre I told her, I'm like, babe, you just drew, like, the best – one of the best tags in the state of Idaho for deer. And what was your initial thought? Well, we can just give that to Braley. Yeah. <laughs> Which I assumed she was going to do. Um, and then I started thinking about it further, and I was like, well, Braley will be 18 in September. The hunt's not till November. Yeah. And I never double checked, but I'm pretty positive that it, you can't pass it down to your child if she's going to be an adult when the hunt comes around. Yeah. Like I was thinking, in the, like when the summer when it, the draws came out, like August, I was like, you could give it to her now. If she's 17. But I don't, anyway, long story short, I just told Kaylee, well, you can't give it to Braley. Engage already has this other deer tag that he'll be happy with. Mm -hmm. Like, and I well, kind of presented any more school. I presented it in a way too that like, hey, this might be a good opportunity for you to go out and like go on a hunt because it should be really fun. It should be a good time of year to go and see a lot of mule deer, especially yeah. a lot of bucks. You know, it's gonna be November. Um, there's gonna be weather to push the deer down, and it's also so also a rut hunt. The bucks are gonna be out and about chasing the ladies. Like, uh, what do you think? Yeah, I I didn't know. For sure. I knew you were excited, which I didn't want to disappoint you in this tag going to waste. But I've always told Casey, you can put me in for hunts, but I will never hunt. I will never, I will never kill something. I will never take the life of an animal. I just, I support it. And, and I have a hard time saying that because I understand it. And I, I say that with no judgment. You know, I'm, I'm so grateful for what you provide for our family, what our kids provide for our family. And, and I understand, but I just always felt that way. I just don't think I can do it. Which, I mean, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think, you know, so you understanding hunting as a kid, understanding it enough to know that your dad goes hunting. Yeah. And he'll bring home, you know, a deer. You can see the antlers, mount them in the garage, you eat some jerky. And then we get married, I shoot some pheasants, I clean them in front of you, we cook them, you have a bad experience. <laughs> but over the years, like, you're just kind of, like, learning a little more, a little more, knowing more, watching the videos, mm -hmm. understanding it is a lot of hard work, it can yeah. be. And then being sent into this position of, okay, you have an opportunity to go and to actually do this, do all these things that you know a little about. Mm -hmm. And in my head, I'm like, that's the only way to really make the ultimate, like, connection with all of this is to get out and experience it. Yeah. And not only, you know, being the tag holder, but going out on a hunt with somebody that has a tag and kind of watching the process. So in my head, I'm like, that's the only way, like, really at, at the end of the day to make that final connection with all of it. Even if you grew up knowing about it, having family that did it, having a husband that does a, a hunting channel, 
like really to understand all of it and to make it all make sense, you really have to go and, and experience it for yourself. Yeah. I mean, I thought that I did know what it was all about. And I felt like I did have a passion for hunting as a non-hunter. But it changed everything. So people that understand as much as you did, which I feel like you understand probably, or you did understand probably more than most, mm -hmm. just because of what, you know, what I do. Yeah. I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's okay for people to understand the necessity to hunt, the the conservation effort that hunting is, the th the good things that that hunters do for the wildlife, the care that we have not only during the season but like in the winter, mm -hmm. in the summer months, like the projects that that are out there that hunters you know sponsor to take care of this this resource, this natural resource we have. I think that's okay. Yeah. Or so they understand all that, but not actually want to go and participate by pulling the trigger. Yeah, I think something else is I knew how much you care about these animals. I I could see it, and and knowing everything that you do, and watching the videos, and how emotional you would get, and just you know the gratitude that I I think for us as a family that we feel every time that we are eating the meat that was provided by this animal, we have always been very grateful. And I, I've always, and I felt, and I, I saw that from you and I felt it for me, but to be out there and to watch how amazing these animals are, you just have such a deeper appreciation and love for the animals. And I think that that's something that's hard for some people to understand how much hunters care and love these animals. Yeah, I think, um, you know, so you finally decided, like, what was the final decision? Or what, do you remember what went through your head this, to think? Because you always think before you speak, right? Or you're supposed to. Mm -hmm. I don't <laughs> always. But somewhere in your head, it clicked, like, before you even told me, like, it had to have clicked, like, maybe I should try this. Yeah, I think, like I said, I didn't want you to be disappointed. You were so excited about the tag. I didn't want it to go to waste. I knew Braylee couldn't do it. And I told you, I'm going to do this, but you can't get mad. If it comes <laughs> down to it and I cannot pull the trigger, you, you can't be mad at me. Yeah, you definitely prefaced the hunt when you, um, you know, when it finally clicked in your head. I think well, I'm going to do this. Uh, and then you spoke those emotions to me, but you definitely preface it with, you cannot be mad if it comes down to it and I can't physically pull the trigger. Yeah. Like, you made that known from the very first start that it might be one of those things that we go out, we work hard, you know, I teach you how to shoot, you practice, we get out there, we do all the things, the steps, the necessary steps to be successful, and then the, the moment of, like the time to pull the trigger and to take that animal's life, like it might just be that thing that we just walk away with and say, hey, great experience. You could have done it if you chose to, but you chose not to. Like yeah. that's okay. And that's how I was thinking about it. Like if I can get you to that point of having the gun on a, on an animal that you choose to take, you're looking through that animal or looking at that animal through your scope, and then you decide like not for me, mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was, I'm a, I am big with my feelings. How am I going to feel in that moment? And I didn't know that was unknown to me. And, and I think that was the thing when it comes down to it, if I don't feel like I can do it, I'm not doing it. <laughs> Which I respect. I respect that a hundred percent. I think about this a lot. I think about, um, if I was a new onset hunter later in life, right? Mm -hmm. So if I would have grown up without um, those experiences of going out in the woods with my dad and watching him shoot deer, watching him shoot pheasants, and then me be becoming old enough to do that stuff myself and me killing my first bird and then a deer and then an elk with a bow, like if I would have never had those experiences, how would I look at hunting later on like now? Mm -hmm. If like re roles were reversed, you grew up as this hunter that loves it, does it all the time. And then you wanted to get me involved. Like, how would I 
how would I perceive it? Mm -hmm. And it's obviously impossible for me to understand what that would look like. Not impossible, but very tough because yeah. just how it is. But I think about that with kids, you know, yeah. like our kids, you know, our oldest two have been out on successful hunts. You know, Braley's killed pretty much everything there is to kill in the mm -hmm. West but outside of sheep. Yeah. She's been fortunate. And uh, Gage is the same. He's killed elk, deer, antelope. And, uh, you know, and I can't remember, like, I remember think like, I can think back to, like, I think it was a pheasant was the first animal I killed and harvested the meat off of, um, took it home. I was very proud of that just yeah. because I'd seen my dad do it. Mm -hmm. Kind of like you, you know, watching me and the kids bring home meat and then cooking it at night and being very proud of that. Yeah. But, like, if I would have never experienced that, you know, what? how would I perceive hunting today? And it's very hard for me to understand that, but. It's great to watch it well, has been great to watch you kind of go through all these steps from when we got married to you have a very small understanding of you know what, what hunting is but now to where you decided to go on a hunt. Yeah. I mean growing up I didn't understand the experience. I didn't I I didn't understand any of it. We went camping. That's basically. Yeah, it. but you had, I I yeah, I should say you understood hunting. Like yeah. you had a knowledge well, of it, hunting. It was normal. It was yeah. what everyone did. Yeah, I mean, we went. You went to a high school that you know kids would take off the opener yeah. and go and hunt and bring their bucks to school in the back of their trucks or bring their pheasants, whatever it was. Like, your dad did it, your family did it. You yeah. understood what hunting was. Right. So we decided to go out. You, you finally made the decision, like, let's go. I'm going to do this, mm -hmm. but it might be one of those things where I can't actually pull the trigger, and I was okay with that. Yeah. The next thing I remember you telling me was you were very nervous about the shooting part of it. Yeah, I. I think I shot a gun or two as a teenager, like early teens, early, early teens. Do you remember like a rifle? No, I don't remember. I remember, I remember you shooting a shotgun of mine. Oh, really? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, 100%. We were with our friends Paul and Leslie and their family, and I remember I forced you into shooting my 12-gauge shotgun, like <laughs> hold it up and just pull the trigger. No way. I don't remember. I have no recollection. I think there might be a picture of that. Anyway... <laughs> You were nervous about the actual, um, not shooting an animal, but actually shooting a gun at first. Yeah. I wanted to feel comfortable because the most important thing to me, if I did pull the trigger, was that I made a good shot. Yeah. And you've, you know, obviously experienced, um, you know, I tell you when we have something go awry yeah. on a hunt, we were, we, we hit an animal, weren't able to find it. We hit an animal, weren't able to recover it for a day. And that's, you know, for a hunter, that's probably one of the most heartbreaking things yeah. that can possibly happen. Yeah. And for a new hunter, and I can testify to this, it probably is the absolute worst thing that will, that could happen. Yeah. Way more so than never having an opportunity to pull the trigger. Cause Absolutely. I saw, I saw it happen with Braley. Yeah. And I wasn't prepared for it. I know I hadn't prepared her for it. Mm -hmm. And it, we were on a bear hunt, uh, running bears with dogs and the bear went tree and Braley got a shot at the bear that came out in front of us at 120 yards 150 yards she made a sh she made a decent shot on the bear but it wasn't a lethal shot mm -hmm. and that bear took off and we <sighs> couldn't find the bear and then it finally hit me like oh my hell I didn't prepare my daughter for this part of it yeah. you know I just wanted to get her out there I wanted to, her to feel comfortable and I you know shot the gun with her a bunch she felt comfortable she was a great shot mm -hmm. Like, she kind of understood hunting. She definitely understand. like, I brought food home. Mm -hmm. You know, she was only 10 at the time, 11 maybe. Yeah. And then it hit me that I didn't prepare for that possibility because it's always a possibility. Yeah. But uh, it, luckily it turned out that we found the bear and she was able to finish it. Yeah. But, um, so, but for you, you understood that enough to know that you definitely didn't want to have that experience. Yeah. I just knew if that happened, it, I just felt like I would never recover. <laughs> yeah. And from my experiences, and I told you this, I said, trust me, you will shoot just fine. I'd never seen you shoot before besides that shotgun. Uh, you'd never had been behind a, a bolt action rifle. You, I, you know, the biggest thing with any new hunter, I don't care if it's a kid. I don't care if it's a, you know, a woman in her thirties. I don't care if it's you know, a dad that hasn't hunted in 20 years, like the hardest thing for any new hunter or anybody out going out uh, new is trying to acquire a target in the scope. Mm -hmm. By far, oh my gosh, in so my hard. experiences, <laughs> the most 
the toughest but the most frustrating thing <laughs> as well. And for whatever reason that, you know, that's out of my brain because, you know, I've done it for so long. Yeah. But it's in my brain because I've taught the kids over the years how to do it. And, you know, but with anybody, it, that's always the hardest thing. Well, that's just, it's so frustrating. It's such a frustrating feeling to not be able to see. Yeah. <laughs> because we always talk like hunting is all about steps, right? Like you go out, you acquire a tag, however, through a draw, you buy an over the counter tag, you buy a tag, whatever. You go out, you learn the area, you f- look for animals, a specific animal, you find the animal, and then you hunt the animal and you get in that position and you do all those things correctly until you get to that point of actually like pulling the trigger and finding the animal, then pulling the trigger. Mm-hmm. And then you get to that step and you can't acquire the target. And it's very frustrating because there's a lot of things going on at the same time. Yeah. A lot of emotion. So anyway, Kaylee was very adamant uh, that she wanted to feel very comfortable behind her rifle. Yeah. And looking back now, if, if anyone is thinking about hunting, I wish that I would have even just practice looking through the scope, not actually even pulling the trigger, but looking through the scope and finding a, a tar- target yeah. or, you know, finding an object. So, which I said we were going to do that more and we didn't do it nearly enough. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it, this year was busy for you. I remember when I was young and I was learning how to do all these things. My dad would uh, tape a little like deer target or a picture of a deer out of a magazine to the wall Mm -hmm. and I'd sit back you know even like 30 feet or in the garage you know maybe 40 feet Mm -hmm. and uh I would look through the scope and acquire that target even up up to that like that close it helps Mm -hmm. learning how to like position that scope and position your head behind the scope so you can get a clear picture yeah um but we should have done that way more but I I took you out shooting Mm -hmm. and what happened what I shot the target. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you can you you can let them let, let them know you're you're being very. She shot amazing. I took her out. She shot three shots at hundred yards. So she was I was having her shoot. That was another question. Like, what caliber should I have her shoot? Um, I always say the very best caliber or gun for a person to shoot is the one that fits them the very best and the one that they're the most comfortable with. Mm-hmm. Like you could go and shoot a thirty three seventy eight that has a lot of horsepower. It's going to knock an animal down. But if you're terrified of that, I'd much rather have you shoot a 300 wind or a 300 Weatherby or a six and a, six and a half Creedmoor. I, I think if you're not scared of the weapon, obviously you're going to shoot it a lot better if it mm-hmm. fits you. So I had her shooting the uh, Weatherby Creedmoor or the Weatherby uh, Camilla in the 6.5 Cree Mort. It's a gun Braley's killed her moose for elk with. I know it has enough horsepower out to a certain amount of range if you make the right shot. So you shot it, and literally she shot three shots. The one she pulled, I could te- definitely tell she pulled when she was squeezing through the trigger, but the other two were literally touching, yeah. which is super impressive. Yeah, I felt, I felt, um, I felt good about how I was shooting, I still felt a little unsure about looking through the scope. Which I think you, the only way to get better at that is a lot of practice. A lot of practice and you can practice yeah. at the range. Um, you can practice at the range. You can practice in the house, doing all those things, and that will help. But the only way you'll ever get very efficient at it is to do it live mode. Yeah. Like, because, as you know, acquiring a target at the range off a, off a bench is mm-hmm. a lot different than acquiring a deer that's moving right. in the snow off of a bipod mm-hmm. and you add all the emotions and conf- you know confusion everything that's going on yeah. when you finally make the decision to get the gun on the animal that um that i think can only be really practiced fully doing it live yeah but you felt very confident um in the shooting, a uh, funny story, I took her out the second time, and <laughs> in my knowledge, all my years of doing hunting things and shooting things and reading and talking to people, especially, you know, a lot of people like to give us advice back, especially after we make a poor shot, <laughs> <coughs> about proper techniques and stuff, which is awesome. I love it. I've learned a lot that way. Yeah. I've always learned that the very most stable position for anybody to shoot off of, if it's a new shooter a super, ex- like, well, you know, versed shooter to a sniper in the military is prone. 
you lay down on your stomach. <laughs> and what I've learned over the years is you want to lay directly behind the gun. So you, you don't want your body canted off the gun. You want your body directly behind the gun. But you're laying on your belly with some sort of rest under the gun. If it's a bipod or if it's a backpack, you lay the gun down on the, on the rest. And you can literally, like, if you have the right rest and you set it upright, you can literally just set the gun down. And really the only thing that should be touching the gun is your shoulder and your, and your finger, which is the very best. You want the least amount of parts touching the gun, in my opinion. Well, I tried to do that with Kaylee on the second trip to the range, and it, it wasn't happening. No. <laughs> I hated it. I hated it so much. I, she hated the position. She hated the drill. And I think at the time she hated me. <laughs> well, let's be honest. You weren't listening. <laughs> she was trying to tell me all these things. And I said, I don't care about any of that. I just want you to lay down here on the gun and feel as comfortable as possible. Because in my head, I kept telling her, telling her stats. Oh, my gosh. Over and over. I was like, I don't care. <laughs> of how majority of people that shoot a gun... And then they've shot, may say they've shot the gun a hundred times. Their preferred position would probably 99% of the time would be prone, laying down. I remember setting the gun on the backpack. We were using a backpack, <laughs> a couple backpacks because that was a hunting scenario. And uh, laying the gun down and uh, telling, kind of showing Kaylee laying on the cement, like, okay, this is how you're going to want to shoot. And she's like, looked at me, she's like, you want me to lay on the cold cement? <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, like. What do you think is going to be out in the woods? Like, there's not going to be a warm blanket. It's probably going to be six inches of snow instead of concrete. Anyway, that experience didn't go great. It went terrible, and I didn't want to go hunting after that. After that, after that little trip to the range, I thought uh, this was over. Well, I, I, I think I was frustrated because I wanted to feel more comfortable with the gun, with the scope, and it, and I felt like we were moving on too quickly. And when I did try to lay down, I could not see anything. I couldn't find the target looking through the scope. I couldn't feel comfortable. I just, I got in my head a little too much thinking if I try to shoot a deer like this, I'm going to make a bad shot. I just felt so uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's not, uh, I'm a fairly decent teacher for the right people. For other people, I'm not a great teacher because sometimes I do not listen. Like, I get to a point where I'm like, I know you have feedback, but I don't want to hear your feedback right now. Because I just, these are the statistics. I just <laughs> want you to do what I'm asking you to do because more times than not, like, this is going to be the very best shot you have. Yeah. Like, even if you feel more comfortable, like, sitting sitting upright, like, with a some sort of, like, stable rest, like a tree branch or a tree or a rock – statistically you're gonna like you can always unless the brush is high or whatever you can always lay down yeah with a couple backpacks yeah so i don't want your feedback right now i just want <laughs> you to try this because i think if you try it and do what i say it, you're gonna feel comfortable and yeah. we never got to that point no i think we needed to ease into it a bit and you didn't want to you wanted to i mean it was time that we needed to move forward and i wanted to go back and we just weren't communicating that well. So <laughs> we have this little hoorah at the, at the range. Um, finally, it was like the hunt was a couple of days later. I didn't know even to the, de the day we left that if Kaylee was going to go. Like I remember Logan's like, what time are we leaving? I'm like, uh, I hope we are leaving. <laughs> and eventually, uh, her first light camo showed up. She wanted to try it out, of course. <laughs> of course. So finally, she came out of the bedroom and was like, what time are we leaving? I'm like. Right now, get your stuff ready. Anyway, so we go over there, and a tool that we've used here recently for um, new shooters, new hunters, is a uh, bog pod. It's a brand that makes um, tripods, all sorts of shooting devices, shooting rests. But a few years ago, they came out with this thing called a death grip. And what a death grip is, is uh, it's a bog pod, so a tripod, three legs, and then on top of it, it's a clamp that you actually, you can put the butt of, or not, the stock of your gun in, and then you just clamp it down, and it grips it, and so that you can, your gun is just like basically free-floating on this tripod. And the benefit of this is helping a new hunter acquire a target. So as, um, you know, I used it with Gage's first elk he killed, he used it. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to find the animal for him, he knew how to do that, but... 
if uh, somebody can't find a target, a deer, or even a target you're shooting, like you can, I can get the gun on the death grip, clamp it down, and then step away from the gun and not touch it, and then have Kaylee shoulder the gun, and it should be right on that target. So when we got over to where we were staying for the hunt, we got over there at night, um, and the hunt had been already been going on for 10 days or so, but I was gone. Mm -hmm. And I told Kaylee, I said, this is like a two-week hunt. The last five days are going to be the very best because mm -hmm. the weather and the migration and the rut will really be in full swing. So we got over there the day before, um, the night before, and I brought out the bog pod, which I was planning on doing the whole time. But the reason I went from shooting off the bench to shooting prone is the likelihood of, of that was going to be more comfortable for you because I prefer that way over a bog pod, just lay prone. And Why? I thought, because I'm way more comfortable. The okay. gun is way more steady. Okay. When you can, like, lay the gun down, which the bog pod does, but when the bog pod's up at 30 inches or whatever it needs to be for you to sit behind it or something, that's a lot of distance. But when the gun's, like, eight inches from the ground on a backpack, it just feels more steady for me. Okay. So we got over there, and I brought out the bog pod at night. And we were, I was like, all right, let's look, let's look at this position. <laughs> and so I put the gun down, and I actually had switched up the gun I wanted her to shoot. I had no idea. I had her shoulder. <laughs> I had her shoot the the six and a half Creed more, um, in the Camilla in the Weatherby Camilla. Then I had her shoot the new Backcountry, um, Ti that we just got in the uh, Weatherby RPM, and then I had her shoulder my Weatherby Mark V thirty three seventy eight. And for whatever reason, the thirty three seventy eight fit her the best. Like she felt the most comfortable with the with scope. the scope. Um, just with the whole setup, like, and so I got her on the bog pod and I put the 3378 on it, which if you've ever shot a 3378, it has a lot of horsepower shooting a big bullet. But honestly, the Mark V with the brake, it just, it doesn't kick that hard. Uh, a lot of people are kind of terrified because that's such a big cartridge. You didn't know any of that. No. <laughs> and I didn't want you to know any of that because I knew that gun wasn't going to kick any harder than any other gun we had, yeah. especially in the moment. And so I put the 3378 on the bog pod, had her sitting with her back up against the couch, and she was like, yeah, why didn't you have me do this at the range? And I'm <laughs> like, well, this is like, the, like if you can't get prone, this would be like a resort. Like, okay, we can try this. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. Well. Yes, but no. Cause it, I yeah. In my head, I would prefer anybody to shoot prone over sitting off of a tripod. Do you just feel like because, do you feel like that's mostly because you don't want to use a tripod? Like, Why wouldn't I want to use a tripod? I don't know. I, you just think that that's a better. The only thing that goes into my decision on how somebody shoots is how they're going to be the very most successful. Okay. I know that didn't resonate when I was trying to tell you that at the range, but I only, when I take somebody out, the only thing I want them to find is success. And the, in my opinion, the very best way to find success in shooting is laying prone. If you have to do something else, great. Like, let's learn that. But if you can learn how to shoot prone, or, or you should learn how to shoot prone probably the quickest, because in my opinion, it's the best. <laughs> but if not, like, you can do those other things. So I wasn't trying to set you up for failure. I was no, I just know. trying to set you up for this is the way you'll feel the more, most comfortable, which yeah. you didn't. And so I got you behind the bog pod, got you set up, and you're like, oh, yeah, this is it. Yeah, this I is how I want to shoot a, shoot a deer. And I'm like, sweet. Yeah. If you feel comfortable, let's do that. It felt comfortable. I felt like I could find the target easily. And it, it just felt so much more comfortable. So the night before, um, finally feeling comfortable in shooting positions. And it's nice with a, bo with a bipod or a tripod that you can sit behind. Usually that allows you to get up above if there's some tall grass or some brush. Like that allows that. Mm -hmm. Um you know, ultimately, if you could stand on a tripod, that would be the best because you're always going to be over the brush then. But it's, again, like, I think the higher you get the gun off, off the ground, the less steady it's going to be. Yeah. So, anyway, th we felt good with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, you were still very adamant about not just, like, you might not be able to shoot a yeah. deer. So, first day we go out, um, plan was, like we do on any hunt, I did a lot of research on on uh, my Onyx. Um, had some tips given to me by some local people, some buddies of mine that live in the area of places to look. And uh, so we kind of like set out, you know, I had some some waypoints marked that I wanted to go and look at. And so we had the Can-Am with us. We were just going to cover country. 
on the Can-Am, hike out some ridges and just glass. That's mm -hmm. kind of our forte is just to cover the country with our, with our eyeballs. Right. And unfortunately that first day it wasn't, uh, the weather was just not great for that type of hunting. Yeah. It was yeah, cold. It was rough. It was cold. I think also when you said you drew one of the best tags in Idaho, for some reason to me, that equaled the easiest hunt. <laughs> like, there, you're going to see the biggest bucks that you've ever seen in your life everywhere. They're just going to be, like, jumping out in front of you. Kind of was my thinking. And uh, also being naive, I didn't understand hunting. So I was telling the kids, like, yeah, well, I'll probably be home in, like, a day or two. <laughs> <laughs> Which is... And, <laughs> and you said the weather is going to be great. It so was. was. It just, was supposed I to I was be. like, yeah, this is going to be just... Easy peasy, like, I don't know why in my head that's what I thought. No, I think that's a misconception with, it's a misconception in my head a lot of the time. <laughs> like, it's a misconception, I think, in a lot of people's heads that not only drawing a tag, like, you draw a tag, like, and especially depending on what state you're mm -hmm. in, right? Idaho, like, you can draw some fairly easy tags every year. Um, you know, they have some unlimited draw tags, but in people's heads, they think it's a draw, it's going to be better, which it should be which it c can be, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, in other states, if you draw, you know, for years people thought if you draw uh, any elk tag in the state of Utah, you're going to kill a 400-inch bull, which mm -hmm. this me means, like, you're going to kill this bull, I'm pointing to Braley's bull, yeah. if you just draw a tag anywhere in the state. And it's just not how it is. Yeah. Like, I think it gives you a better opportunity maybe to find a, a more mature animal, and maybe you're going to see more animals as a whole, but it's not necessarily going to be easy. Right. But that's not just a misconception. In your head, I think that's a misconception in a lot of people's heads that have hunted for a long time, especially guys that have hunted over-the-counter tags and then finally luck into a draw tag. Yeah. But it's not the case. Yeah, so day one I was like, excuse me, what now? What's so happening? It was <laughs> rough, yeah. Like, we, we did what – we stuck to our guns. I wanted – I always say I want to check boxes. Like, I knew this area was good. Like, I had researched it. Um, I knew there was, should be deer moving into this, this lower country. They should, if they had enough snow, should be uh, wintering there. Plus, it was great rutting grounds, um, had all the feed they needed at the time. So, like, I just want to go in there and check that box. Like, yeah, it is great. Or it's not, like, there's not a lot of deer in there yet. You know, like, maybe come back here in a couple of days. But it just didn't allow us to do that with the weather because it was snowing and then it was foggy. And, like, we just couldn't, I didn't feel like we were very efficient glassing that country. Yeah, but at the same time, I am grateful for day one because we knew what to expect, that the weather was probably going to suck, so let's dress warmer. Um, and I realized I didn't know how to glass <laughs> at all. I didn't. I had the cover on my binos every single time I tried to look through. Every single time I tried to look through them, I forgot that they had. The <laughs> I probably should have took those the off. Yeah, I probably should have. Um, but I, I realized that that is something else that I – need to practice well yeah they're all definitely um i think hunting to be an efficient hunter you learn a bunch of a bunch of different skills mm -hmm. yeah i think one of the most important things that i think is overlooked especially in today's world is just being a good woodsman yeah being able to go out and survive in the woods and be able to navigate the woods being able to figure out the, the best path mm -hmm. from point a to point b like following a game trail walking on a south slope compared to a north slope all these things i think being able to glass efficiently, mm -hmm. being able to know like what you're looking for and how to find it. Yeah. I also feel like that was a day that I learned a lot about how deer migrate. You, you and Logan both told me this is what they like to eat. This plant survives longer. This is what, this is where I like to look for them. And it was so interesting to me because again, these are things that you don't understand fully if you're not out in nature yeah and that was amazing to me and you grew up knowing these things to me I I didn't realize like how much goes into all of all of this how animals survive and how amazing nature really is yeah it's interesting if you have a removed perspective of you know and we keep, I keep talking like, you know, you understood hunting, your dad hunted, you know, we take these steps, you knew, knew about it more because you've watched my videos and I've explained to you some things. I, kn I know that you, it's important that you go out and you replant sage, sagebrush. <laughs> I didn't understand fully how important that is that hunters do these things. 
Yeah, there's a lot of dynamics that go into it. And uh, I think in order to be a good good hunter, efficient hunter, you have to understand a lot of these different things. And a way to, to learn these things is to go out and experience, even for me, right? Like, I feel like Eric is a way more efficient hunter in the winter than I ever would be because why? He's out there in the winter looking for sheds mm -hmm. or in the springtime. So that he kind of understands the story of, you know, he hunts elk in the rut. He help hunts elk in post rut. And then for most people, most hunters, they really kind of lose track of where the elk go or what they do after, you know, a late season elk hunt and into the winter months and into spring when they should. But he understands that because he's out there experiencing mm -hmm. that year round. And so all these different times of, and chances for you to be out learning and seeing different times of the years, I think, goes a long ways to be a more efficient hunter is to understand the complete story of an elk cycle during the whole year. Yeah. And as a new hunter, like starting at the brass tacks of, okay, it's wintering, they're wintering, it's winter, they need lots of feed. Mm -hmm. They need high protein feed. Where can we find that at? Yeah. So day one wasn't a bust by any means. We got out, saw a lot of country for what we could see. We saw some bucks. Mm -hmm. We saw, I would say, a very nice deer. Well, and it was exciting because we spent the majority of the day seeing nothing. So to find a buck was really exciting. Yeah, that's how most hunting is, is, man, like, especially like general season tags in, in early October when they're not doing their mating rituals and they're not coming down from the high country. It's You work really hard to hopefully just find an animal. Right. And hopefully that animal is, is one you want to put your tag on. More times than not, it's not. And so you move on, but you consider those days W's, right? Mm -hmm. A yes. win. So we saw a buck right before dark. Um, Kaylee looked him over. It was a nice three by four. I would say a four-year-old deer. And uh, she was like, yeah, let's keep looking. This is kind of fun. Yeah. Even though we had a really terrible day of weather, like snow blowing sideways, like even driving the Can-Am, I couldn't see because of the snow blowing in my eyes. <laughs> and then tried to glass it. Anyway, we don't need to dive into all the details of every day. But say after like day, so day two, one was kind of tough, mm -hmm. inclement weather. Got to experience that though. Like mm -hmm. you got to check that off. Yep. And then day two is like completely different. Yeah. And I told you that I'm like, day one was windy. There was a storm and whatever animal I've ever hunted, just don't love those conditions, especially yeah. the wind. Yeah. But, but it's good. That's what you kept saying. It's good to have days like this because tomorrow is going to be better. Yeah. When you go from real bad. <laughs> and then like real good isn't like that far away from it yeah. once you've experienced the bad, right? So day two is perfect weather. Yeah. Like no, the storm had blown out, you know, the wind had blown the storm out. The wind had calmed down. It was calm. It was cold, which I always want cold. Yeah. Because um, the animals typically will stay on their feet longer and feed longer. Um, but it was clear. And we saw it was, I think you made the the remark of it's like we're on a whole different planet. And even though we were, we went back to the same exact spots, it was like we were on a whole different planet because we, we could see the animals yeah. were moving. There was deer everywhere. Yeah, everything was just so different. So, you know, we go through and uh, finally, I think when it was some point in this hunt, mm -hmm. you were like, okay, I, I think I can kill a deer. I still, I don't know. I don't know if I knew that I would, for sure. Honestly, until it came, until we found, until the last day. I don't know. Well, day three, um, no, maybe it was day two. We had, there was a really nice buck right offside the road, and we kind of stopped and looked at him twice. We looked at him once, mm -hmm. and he took off. And I was like, at the first time I looked at him, I was like, yeah, it was a nice deer. Yeah. Um, and really, like, I always want, I never want to be the ca shot caller. I don't want to be I like, know, yeah. Unless it's something that's a no-brainer, and, and, and I'm to. like, you probably should shoot that one. I don't want to be the guy to be like, oh, like, nah, hold off. I'll give you my opinions, but at the end of the day, and we say this with anybody that we hunt with or ourselves, if you look at an animal and excites you, you should probably shoot that yeah. animal. I think that um, I felt like I didn't know enough to get excited. Does that make sense? I don't. Yeah. You know. The deer all look similar to me. Yeah, we're, I mean, you look at a, a deer, a four-year-old deer, right? You put a four-year-old deer out in front of somebody at a couple hundred yards, it's going to look like a really nice deer. Mm -hmm. You know, their bodies are all about 
the same size. They're all bigger than the does. Mm-hmm. They're all bigger than the small bucks. So their bodies look big. Four years is a good time for, you know, a deer to really start sprouting to like what he's going to be. And so, yeah, like when you look at that same age class, definitely can see like, yeah, they all look good. Yeah. Right. And, and I think something else when we were glassing, I would notice you and Logan would say a lot, this deer is going to be incredible in two years. And, and I'm grateful for these conversations because it makes you realize, or it made me feel like I need to be patient because what could this animal be? And I know that you would say, well, you don't even know if it's going to make it through the winter. You don't know. So you can't go into it with that mindset if it feels right. But to me, I was like, I, I think that that buck needs two more years. And honestly, like, yeah, that's kind of how I feel. Um, if I'm out on a hunt for myself or I'm out helping a kid, my, one of my kids helping you helping, you know, my dad. And I do not think, you know, there's a lot of controversy in shooting, you know, a certain age class of deer, um, you know, weight, you know, shooting the older deer better, which I understand, but also like, I think it's like fly fishing. There's a lot of people that don't think you should eat a trout. I think there's trout and rivers that need to be eaten. Mm. I think there's two year old deer that need to be shot. Yeah. Uh, if you're looking for the very, very best meat out on the, out on the mountain and you have a deer tag in your pocket, a two year old deer is going to be way better than a five or six year old deer. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, like in my head, I get excited when I find a mad- old deer, right? Yeah. Not not talking about his antler configuration, the size of him, but like when I see an animal, a deer, elk, whatever, and I know that deer or that animal's lived, s- you know, five, six, seven years, mm-hmm. like I'm like, okay, because, you know, that's kind of how I test my skills. Like if I can find the older deer, the older animal, the mature animals, like they've been around the longest. Yeah. They're the smartest. They've had the most experience and like I've honed my skills. But at the same time, I don't think there's anything wrong with shooting a three-year-old deer. I don't yeah. think there's anything wrong with shooting a four-year-old deer, especially on public land because like what I told you, maybe in two years that deer is something spectacular and he's lived his life and passed on his gene, mm-hmm. his seed. Who says the next guy that comes behind us right. 10 minutes later isn't going to shoot that deer and just be happy as can be and I'm okay with that. Yeah. So trying to like figure out a way to like, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, but like management of, of mature deer on public land is just not a thing. Yeah. But we like, I didn't want to get into any of that with you, but our conversation with me and Logan, we go there because that's how we talk. Right. It's just, it's normal conversations, but I was learning so much just from listening to you guys. And it was interesting and it was, it felt important. And to hear you say, you know, it's, it's good if you can find like an older, an older deer, you know, whatever. And so, yeah, day, you know, we, we saw this deer, we got excited, you know, he ran off one time, we found him again, like literally 150 yards off the road. We get out and, you know, this time of year, deer are just being dumb deer. Yeah. And that's why the the appeal to hunt them in the, in the rut is so appealing to most hunters because in August, September, October, they're not that way. Mm -hmm. You know, the the mature animals, the, the bucks especially, are in the trees. You very rarely see them out. And st- and then in November, like, it's the does that you're worried about. The does are going to bust you. Yeah. And the bucks are just doing Chasing what the does the, do. Yeah. And so anyway, like, we had this opportunity, and I was like, man, like, it's a great deer. Yeah. I think you'd be happy with it. And I, we had that experience. If you guys, if you haven't, go watch this film. This is going to all make a lot more sense. Plus – I will say this right now. I should have prefaced this whole podcast, and maybe I did. Is this hunt, for many reasons, but this hunt and what we were able to capture is probably some of the best we've ever captured. And it's not because I'm biased and you're my beautiful wife and it was your first hunt, but it really, for whatever reason, it's hard to, like, put your finger on it. But watching it, and there's been a lot of feedback, like, it really told the story of a hunt. Mm-hmm. It really told the story of an ups and up, the ups and the downs and the emotion and the excitement. And especially add all, add all that emotion and excitement for a new first time hunter in the picture. Like this is by far the best video we've captured this year and one of the best we've ever captured. But go and watch it if you haven't. But um, I kind of lost my place. But so moving on, I felt like after that, personally, I felt like, okay, like, 
you realized the situation after the fact? Yeah, well, I took too long to, to decide, okay, yeah, I want – well, you said you can get on the gun and then decide if you if you feel good about it because I was like, I don't know, I don't know. And then it was, like, rushed because I waited too long and and I missed my opportunity to even get on. Yeah, so by the time we got Kaylee out, got the gun out, got the bipod out, got it set up, the deer had had, they'd watched us long enough. They were, yeah. they were not leaving the country, but they're headed for, for deeper canyons. And, uh, you know, after that, I felt like, okay, she's, she's felt enough or experienced enough of this that I felt at the time, like she's going to kill a deer. Yeah. I think I felt more comfortable. Well, I think that when you said you can, you can get on the gun and then decide, I felt good about that because I knew that I was giving myself the opportunity, like really giving myself the opportunity to make the decision. And, and I realized at that moment, I need to give myself this opportunity. Yeah. Quicker. And then I can decide how I'm feeling. And so that day went by and it was phenomenal. We saw another buck that was, you know, right there. Mm -hmm. I think you would have been super happy with, um, and I would have been happy with anything that you were happy with, obviously. Yeah. Like, you deciding that you could kill a deer, killing a deer, being stoked on it. Like, that's the experience I wanted. And, and the whole thing is, with this hunt was I knew I wanted you to have a certain experience. Yeah. Because I want everyone to have a certain experience out in the woods, you know, especially if it's their first time or they're still new to it, to want to, like, come back. Or maybe not even, like, you decide it w it wasn't for you, but you really understand, like, all the pieces are coming into the puzzle now. Yeah. And so, like, I didn't know exactly how to explain that experience beforehand, but I knew I wanted you to have some sort of of adventure that would kind of, like, put all those puzzle pieces together for you. Yeah. From knowing, you know, understanding your dad hunted to eating some jerky to having a BB in the breast of a pheasant to understanding the work that goes behind it to understanding that it doesn't, you know, it's not just you go out and kill the first animal you see on the first day, but you have to work at it. Mm -hmm. You have to take these steps. And so by day four, I was, I was happy with how everything had gone. Like we had seen yeah. a lot of deer. We, had, you know, day three came, it was terrible weather again, but we did see a couple more mature deer. We mm -hmm. got on them. Um, again, kind of a little late because that's what happens most of the time is, you know, you find the animal, it knows you're there, and you only have, like, a few moments to make a decision, to get a gun set up, get acquire the target, pull the trigger before they're gone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you haven't done it a lot, it's it's a lot going on. Yeah, right. And so day four comes, and, you know, kind of the same thing. We're out glass and seeing a lot of deer. And in my head, I'm like, all right, we're not finding, like, that next level of, like, giant buck, which mm -hmm. is fine. Yeah. You know, we looked over so many beautiful, mature four-year-old deer is what mm -hmm. I would say. A four-year-old deer, I think, is, like, just getting to their prime, Yeah. in my opinion. And I think we saw a lot of those. Yeah. And then um, day four that evening, uh, I we were glassing kind of mm -hmm. the same country. Oh, I found one. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell this story. <laughs> so, again, going back, like, in my head, everyone wants to shoot a 200-inch typical mule deer, you know, whatever that might be, that number, right? And I do as well. But I also love the fact of finding a really old, mature deer, like one that has, like, not just got to his prime, but it's, like, maybe a year or two past his prime. And, like, do you really like it when they also have bad genetics? <laughs> well, <laughs> so the story, like, we find this, I find this deer, and he's old, like, I <laughs> I looked at him. I'm like, man, that's grandpa. That's, that's like a, a gnarly six year old, seven year old, maybe deer, <laughs> and maybe I'm way off with my guessing of his age. But he just looked old. He had that face on him. He had the gut on him. His antlers just weren't beautiful. But weren't they terrible? Th well, it was like a giant. I'd have to watch the video again. But it's like <laughs> a giant, like two by three. You know, you can just tell he like you, if he ever had good genetics, he's past those. <laughs> Um, hopefully he passed him on, but he had like passed his prime of his beautiful, you know, majestic four by four frame. It was just this big old gnarly two by three. And I'm like showing Kaylee. And she's like, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, mm, whatever. I'm like, well, that deer is pretty cool. And she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, it's old. Like that's the oldest deer we've seen. It's old and it has terrible genetics. And it has terrible genetics in my head. Like <laughs> again, like, like you don't, you know, yeah. yeah. Like you're not, you're not killing that 
<laughs> mature four year old in his prime, like not even to his prime, but he has like that perfect <laughs> silhouetted four by four frame. You know, he's got the perfect genetics. I'm like, that deer's cool. If it would have been me, I probably would have shot the deer. <laughs> and Kelly makes the, she's like, you want me to shoot that old deer with ugly antlers? <laughs> With terrible genetics. I'm like, well, like, yeah. Like, like, that's... I'm so confused. And then, you know, I'm, <laughs> again, I have to remove myself from that conversation because I want her to shoot something that's going to make her happy. And at this point, you've come to the conclusion that you were going to you were, you were gonna be capable of shooting a deer if it was the right deer. Yeah. And you said that multiple times after, like, day two, day three, had some experiences. You're well, like, I can shoot the d- a deer if it's the right deer. I think um, a part of me felt like... Am I making a mistake to pass up on these bucks that we've seen? Am I, like, am I going to regret that? And, you know, I'd, I don't know, but it just didn't ever feel like what I should do. Which is good, man. I think that's, you know, that you stuck to your guns. And that, I think that was important because you definitely had some, some you know, you, you were adamant about sh- – if you were able to shoot a deer, it had to be the right deer, right? Yeah. So we weren't you weren't just trying to go out there and shoot a four point or shoot a deer, to shoot a deer, but like it had to f- make sense, mm-hmm. I think, in your head, but it had to feel right as well. Yeah. And so after the big ugly gnarly grandpa deer didn't feel right. Didn't feel right. <laughs> <laughs> there was kind of some like contention, not contention, but just like I could tell Kaylee was like, kind of like I was wearing on her maybe a little bit. About, you know, like, hey, uh, you know, I wanted to give her, her my input without making the decision. You can't make yourself sound like you were like, hey. And well, I'm like, that was stupid. No, but I was like, well, you want to shoot an old deer? Uh, anyway, moving on. <laughs> 20, uh, 10 minutes down the road, we get out and we're looking at a bunch of deer. Like, it's another beautiful day. But it was the second to last day of the hunt. The next day was going to be the last day of the season. Mm-hmm. Not only the, the last day we could hunt, it was the last day you could. the tag was good for. Yeah. Which... More times than not, I'm okay with that. Yeah. And we'll, and we'll talk about that here shortly. But mm-hmm. 10 minutes down the road, I am get out and I start glassing. The same country we've been glassing, but it's migration. It's the rut. You never know when that deer, the deer, just pops up. <laughs> and so we're glassing, and I find this one deer that's kind of like in between a bunch of groups or a couple different groups of deer. And immediately I knew. Mm-hmm. Immediately I knew, like, that was the buck that I was hoping we would find for you. Mm-hmm. Not wanting to like you to like know that emotion. Yeah. But we we got the spotter on it. What was your thoughts? I uh, I definitely could feel your excitement. You said that it was an older buck, so I I felt those things going into it and when I saw him I was like, "Yeah, let's let's do this. This feels this feels like what we w- we've been out here doing. This feels like w- the right thing. <sighs> this feels like where our journey has led us. Yeah, for sure. I enjoyed the journey, and I felt like this this is it. And I feel like that like sums up or describes to me in my head like the absolutely perfect hunt that I not only want for people I take out, the kids, you – you know, hunt winner. Mm-hmm. That's the hunt like that I like strive to have for myself. Mm-hmm. I love to go out and I love to learn new country. I love to work for it. I love to glass over a lot of country, look over a lot of animals because I absolutely love glassing probably more than anything yeah. when it comes to the hunting woods. I, I love understand that now. sitting behind the vortex and just picking apart country mm-hmm. and working for it, making some decisions And then finally acquiring, and what would I say, acquiring the target. Finding the animal, whatever it might be, a big buck. You could be out, have a doe tag and find the right doe. Like, whatever it is, like, you acquire the animal that you are going to be happy to put your tag on Mm -hmm. and take home for whatever reason that is. Right. And so after that, that's like we acquired the target. Right. Because really, to me, like, it's just all steps to that point. You got to get a tag, however... You got to go out and learn the country. You got to look over the country. You got to work for it. You got to like check some boxes, find some areas that don't have animals, check those off the box, like do all these things or check them off the list until you acquire the target. And then when you acquire the target, then that's when to me, like that's when your hunting skills really come into play. Mm -hmm. So once the target is acquired, like, okay, now you have to figure out how the best way is to go in there and kill that animal. Yeah. 
and we were far away and unsure if I could make the shot from where we were when we first spotted him. Yeah, so we glassed him up across a little canyon, and I think I ranged him at like 750 yards, mm -hmm. which, you know, the gun is very capable of doing that. We obviously decided to go with the 3378, and just, you know, this year, I've had the gun for probably three years and never set it up, and then this summer I was like, um, I had some elk tags I drew this year, or, or an elk tag, and I'm like, I'm going to shoot the 3378. So this summer I went to the long or Thompson's Long Range in Cache Valley, which these guys do a phenomenal job. If you've never heard of Thompson Long Range, look them up. Um, they've become our buddies over the years, and so they'll, they help us set up the guns. But they basically run a long-range shooting course where you can go there, either purchase a Weatherby from them. Um, they're a big 3378 fan. And so they, anybody that comes and b purchases a gun is usually a Weatherby 3378, just like the one I had. Anyway, you can go through this course, and they'll show you how to set up the, gu the scope properly on your gun, and then they will walk you out. And by the time you're done with this course, which is less than a day, you're shooting – your gun is accurate at a thousand yards and you have a dope chart and all that. Anyway, the gun was capable of that. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you're at. 750 yards is a long ways. And especially with the amount of variables that are out there, wind, well, crosswind, you doe, know, the does, the does, you know, whatever it is like. So, I mean, like the deer's at 700, 750 yards. And we're, we're like, all right, we got to figure out how to get closer. So we, we go around, mm -hmm. we make the game plan. We start hunting the deer. We get to literally 322 yards, 326 yards, something like that. And I find the buck. And uh, he was behind a doe. And so we got the gun set up, got the bog pod out, got the weather beyond the bog pod, got Kaylee behind it. She saw the, the target. Mm -hmm. And it just, all you could see was his head, yeah, his antlers. And then he was literally standing behind one doe. Yeah. And, uh, did you think at that time, like, it was going down? I don't know. I definitely thought it was possible. I didn't think he was going to stay in that position for an hour because, again, I don't understand their behavior. Um, I was hopeful. I felt hopeful in that moment. And, again, I enjoyed it. I, I liked the experience of spotting him or, you know, looking through the scope and – I liked all of that because I was feeling more comfortable, but I don't think I, I did think that I would have an opportunity. Yeah, probably. Yeah. It was one of those scenarios where again, you know, it's November end of November bucks are definitely hot into the, uh, into the rut. The does are, are in heat. And so this buck was just locked in on this doe. And I don't know if he was just smart enough or he was just doing what a buck would do in his situation, but he was locked in on this doe and this doe was smart enough to know that we were danger, but she wasn't going to like, she didn't want to run away. Mm -hmm. She was just kind of standing there and the buck was so locked in on the doe. He just never moved. Yeah. Anyway, long story short, the opportunity never arose for a good shot. They kind of took off. Um, and it was kind of like over Yeah. that to point. Like we found the target, we got close and it just didn't work out. Yeah. I think that that was the first time I felt disappointed with the hunt and I disappointed in myself. Like maybe I shouldn't have waited. Maybe I should have, you know, taken, I, I don't know. Maybe I should have given myself permission maybe to shoot these other deer or, or not been so caught up in my feelings, you know, but that isn't true to who I am. Yeah. And so at the end of the day and you helped me like, no, that, that didn't feel right. It's okay. You've, don't even think about that. That's in the past. Yeah, because what you're referring to is that first deer that was kind of questionable. We yeah. saw day two. It was right off the road. We got set up. And you were not hesitant, but you were just... I was pretty hesitant. Cautious. You know, you're trying to make that, that decision. And again, you know, in the hunting woods, things happen really fast. Yeah. Now looking back, you're like, man, I wish I would have, like, decided faster. Probably didn't... You didn't wait as long as you thought you did. Like, it just didn't happen. Yeah. And in my head, I'm like... You know, three days later, we find the buck yeah. that we were looking for, finally, I think. And so, like, you go back to that, and I'm like, I told you, I'm like, you can't think about that two yeah. days ago. Like, we've moved on from that. Right. This is what we have in front of us. Even though it didn't work out tonight, 
like now we've acquired the target. We know the target exists. Like yeah. before, because you know beforehand, you're just hoping to find the deer that's going to make you happy. You're hoping to see the deer. You're hoping that deer exists. Mm-hmm. You're hoping that you know the deer's out there. Yeah. And then we find it that you were like overly happy about yeah. that. You were like, "Yep, that's the one. I could shoot that one." Yeah. Forget all about all that stuff that happened before. Now we have, you know, our job ahead of us. Yeah. The way I look at it, and honestly, now looking back. And at the moment, I remember thinking like that because that deer stood there for 30 plus minutes Mm -hmm. with Kaylee looking at him, like getting on him. Like, I'm like, you just study him, watch him through the scope. If that doe moves away, he steps out like we're going to have a shot. That scenario was probably the very, very best thing that could have happened for you on that hunt. Yeah. I think a situation like that and going back to like the only way to practice that is in live mode. Mm -hmm. That was live mode. Yeah. That was live mode. You you could acquire the target through the scope. You learned where to put your head to get that clear picture. Mm-hmm. You know, you had that, that clear picture, um, field of view that everyone talks about when you're shooting a, a rifle. And you studied him. You watched him. Yeah. You knew it wasn't – he didn't ever present, present a good shot. And so you knew that. So moving forward after that, you were so much well, more well-versed in all those things that you were worried about at the first of the hunt than you ever would have been without that experience. Yeah. Yeah. And after you said that I did, you know, driving home, I thought I wouldn't have had all of these opportunities, these experiences and the opportunities that we had, if I would have made a quick decision on the second day, I would have missed out on so much. Yeah. And so that was day four. And, you know, (laughs) I remember talking to you that night or like right after that. And you're like, is that deer going to be here tomorrow? Yeah. And I, you know, I'm a pretty big believer in like, unless something crazy happens, especially that time of year in the rut, like there's plenty of does in there. Like that deer is going to be somewhere. Mm -hmm. We know he exists. That's what makes me happy. He's like, I know the deer exists. Now it's on us to like find him again. Yeah. But I know he's here. And I think that just adds a lot of confidence to a person when you know it's there, it's just on you that you have to go do what you can do to find him. Yeah. And if you don't, it's probably your fault. You didn't look hard enough. You didn't, like, set up enough, a good enough game plan. Whatever it is, like, as long as I know I have confidence that that target's out there, like, I'm good. Mm-hmm. And so the next morning I told you a very important phrase. You remember the phrase? The last day is better than the first day. Last day is better than the first day. <laughs> and it's funny because we say that, and unfortunately a lot of times our hunts do come down to, like, the last few days. Like, we spend a lot of time. Yeah. You know, and it's not because of the cameras by any means, but – Anytime we go on a hunt, it's like, okay, how's this adventure going to unfold? And we always just allow that adventure to unfold however it does. Yeah. But if you go out and kill an animal on the very first day within the first, you know, hour, it's really hard to, like, tell a really good story through film. Yeah. But at the same time, like, that's the story, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if we just saw a giant buck and you felt like that buck was the right buck first day, first morning, first hour, and shot it, like, I'd have been thrilled because that's what it was. Yeah. But I going mean, looking back, back, I'm so grateful that didn't happen. Yeah. And I am too, because I really think well, like what we were talking about earlier, the real way to like have all these puzzle pieces make sense. And from going from understanding that your dad hunts to understanding deer behaviors mm-hmm. and deer movements. And especially that time of year, like you have to have those experiences. Yeah. And even though it was only, you know, a five day hunt, is kind of a short hunt for us anymore, but it's five days of you with experiences that you would have never had otherwise Mm -hmm. if you didn't decide to try this thing for yourself. Yeah. And so last day is better than the first day. We say that for numerous reasons. It's first off, uh, we tell a really good story that way. (laughs) Uh, We have a lot of footage to use to to create a, a film. But also, like, we know more mm-hmm. about that country because every, every unit's different. Every state's different. Like, I n- haven't spent a lot of time in that unit before. So we knew the unit better. We knew what the deer were doing at that time. We knew that we had found a deer that you were going to be happy with. Mm-hmm. And so we say the last day is better than the first day because we can use all that knowledge to go into the very last day with a really good game plan of how we're going to be successful. Yeah. And that day, my good buddy Cody uh, that lives over there, offered to come help um i sent him the video and he's like yeah we need to kill that deer Mm -hmm. and so cody came and helped um we 
uh, Rodin's Jeep, which was nice, was enclosed. It was very nice, yes. Um, the Can Am's awesome, but it's just not fully enclosed yet. Yeah. Anyway, so we go out and we're looking for that deer. Yeah. And, you know, in the back of my head, I knew it was a definite possibility we wouldn't find that deer mm-hmm. and it would be on us. Yeah. Um, but I also knew that, like, we had a very good chance of having a, an opportunity at that deer again. Yeah. And not to ruin the film for you be- if you haven't watched it, but we turned up that deer. Uh, we turned up that deer, like, you know, he was a little ways from where we had seen him last. Maybe I said like a half mile in the video. I think it was more like a mile. Yeah. From where we had seen him last, but it wasn't far. Like for a deer, that's nothing, mm-hmm. right? And we turned him up, got on the gun again, and yeah. laying down. Laying down. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. I did feel more, way more comfortable not laying on cement, and I don't know. I, I felt a lot more comfortable doing that, and I felt like I could do that. Yeah. And looking through the scope, I mean, it was it was pretty hectic. That moment was pretty hectic. But I did feel a lot more comfortable. Yeah, so the but scenario, we kind of like rolled up on this ridge. And I'd seen a couple does off the ridge down in this canyon. And I went, I can't even remember what I was going, I went to do something. Mm-hmm. And uh, Logan and Cody had jumped out. And they had, had walked to the edge where I'd seen those does. And I was in the Jeep doing something. And I turned around and their eyes were just like got giant. And they're like, big buck, big buck. Yeah. There he is. So we were yard sailing out of the jeep with the gun Mm -hmm. you know the packs and i get kaylee to the edge and by this time the deer know we're there get her set up and about the time i found the where the buck was he was bedded in the trees the does had got up and he just followed and they were beelining it directly away from us up over the ridge Mm -hmm. and so kaylee trying to find the deer me trying to like communicate (laughs) what was going on to her (laughs) in the video it's kind of funny but it tells a story of what if you've ever had somebody out hunting that's newer or yourself and it's just frustrating moment like well there was just so much happening it was it was chaotic yeah it felt like but also i felt like i needed to stay calm i don't know i was like get this half get this hat off of me (laughs) a lot of orders were being barked from me and kaylee i'm yelling at logan to give me his binos i'm (laughs) asking kaylee if she can find the deer she's yelling at me to pull her hat off anyway the deer runs off yeah and i'm still like okay with i'm like all right no, because that time of year, deer just don't bust and just take off out of the country. They just kind of, like, get out of, like, what they feel like is danger. Uh-huh. The bucks just fall in the does. So we work ourselves up, and we find the deer, and we're just – I'm like, let's let them calm down. They're, at like, 600 yards at this point, and they're just kind of feeding, and we just sit back, and we're kind of, like, watching them. Mm-hmm. And they go up – and w- w- our plan was once they go up over the ridge, we're going to go circle around, and I thought I had a pretty good idea of the canyon they were going to be in. So the deer go up over. We kind of just let them chill out. Um, you know, they're not on uh, high alert by any means at this point, but they kind of know we're there. Anyway, so we circle around, we hike into this canyon, sneak into this canyon, yeah. and uh, get kind of get set up where we can see the majority of it. And uh, we can f- we found two of the deer that were with this big group. So this big buck was with like eight or nine other does and then two smaller bucks. Mm-hmm. And so we get into this, work ourselves into this canyon, and we start glass, and we find... The, the little the other buck. two point and then the little four point that was with them. Mm-hmm. We're like, oh man, they got to be right here. So we sit there and uh, there was a part of the canyon I couldn't see. So I, ba- I told him, I'm like, I'm going to sneak out of here and go try to find that big buck with his does. And I go crawling around the mountain, never found him, come back. And I was set up. And Cody and Logan had got Kaylee set up on the little or four point. Yeah. And... And they got you set up pretty quick, so I kind of, like, had yeah. snuck up ahead so I could see into the canyon a little more. And I look back, and, like, the gun's set up. Kaylee's on it looking. I'm like, she better not shoot that deer without me by her. Well, and I never would. Well, and it would have been fine if you were happy, but I just. I The th- reason that I liked that is because I felt like I could practice. Yeah. Like, I again, kept, like, great the experience, gun around, you know? finding it again. No, there's no uh, cartridge in the chamber, you know, the Gun's not loaded, but Kaylee's sitting behind the gun in a real-life hunting situation Mm -hmm. with the scope on a bed of deer with plenty of time to, like, get those experiences, get those, like, minutes behind a scope in the woods looking at an animal. And those are priceless. Mm -hmm. And so I sneak back over, and I sit right next to Kaylee, and I'm like, all right, I can't find that big buck. And it's a very good possibility that we're not going to find that big buck again. Like, Or I said that it is a possibility. Like, we could still find that big deer. I, I still have hope. But just so you know, 
that deer might have like slipped out on us. We might not see him again, only having a half a day left to hunt. Yeah. Do you want to kill that deer? The deer that's laying down in the bed in yeah. his bed. No. I didn't want to. I wouldn't have. And so it was a younger deer, like it probably a three year old, two and a half year old, three year I don't know, three year old deer. Nice deer it would have been happy. I think you would have been happy with it. Most people that kill deer, mule deer especially, you know, you know, you gotta understand like my first three deer I killed were like maybe a year and a half old, mm-hmm. two points. And I was thrilled with it. it was a great experience. I eat the meat, the meat's amazing. Yeah. And so like for you in my head I was like, if you shoot this deer, like you'll be stoked. Yeah. Four point. You know, like people will be stoked for you. Your dad will be happy mm-hmm. for you. Like the kids will be thrilled. Yeah. But you didn't want to kill it. Yeah. And I think, you know, when I made that decision, I feel like it was already made. But to, you know, say like, no, I'm, I'm not going to kill this deer. You know, it was hard because we had been away from home for a long time. That's hard for me. This was the longest that I had ever been away from any of my kids. In 18 years, I haven't spent this much time away from my kids. But then... Uh, but then realizing, but also in that moment, I realized how much that I really loved hunting. I loved every day that we were freezing cold. I loved every experience. I loved every conversation. I, I just loved it all. And so I was okay. I felt like I would leave this hunt and this experience with no regrets, even if we didn't find that buck. I knew that I would be really grateful and I would feel proud of what we had done. So I felt good about that. I feel good about that decision. Again, you stuck to your guns. Like it didn't feel right. Yeah. And I was good. I was happy for you. I was like, you know, a lot of people, especially, um, you know, somebody that's hunted for a while realizes the situation and is like, you know, that buck is a great buck and And I can kill it last day and I'll go home, you know, with some meat. And that's, you know, a big reason why we're out here. Mm -hmm. And so, like, you made the decision. I was happy. I wanted to present that opportunity for you to be like, hey, like, you can kill this deer right now. You 200 yards, like, you'll smoke this thing. Yeah. And filled your first tag, killed your first animal ever, like, take meat home where, you know, we'll enjoy it as a family for the next six months to a year. And every time we eat it, we'll be like, this is mom's Mm -hmm. because that's what we like to do, you know, like, every time – Every night we cook whatever up, like taco soup last night with the venison that Gage killed, and we talk about that, or the steaks that Braley killed off the elk or whatever, and we talk about that. And uh, it would have been great. Yeah. But you made the decision. You were like, no, I don't want to kill that deer. Yeah. And I was thrilled for you. Yeah. And so the plan was is Cody's like, all right. I'm like, let's go back to the truck, um, you know, because we had hiked into this canyon. I'm like, let's go back to the truck, circle around where we can glass back into this can- this side of the canyon we can't see. Mm-hmm. And Cody's like, all right, I'll meet you guys at the truck. Basically, I'm going to go around, um, circle around to do something to look off this edge. And I'm like, I was just there, but whatever. And uh, he left, and we were kind of gathering up our stuff. Weren't we hiking somewhere else? I thought we were hiking. Well, we were going to go back to the truck. Okay, I thought we were going. And then Cody found the buck. Yeah. And was like, I found the deer. Yeah. And he explained to me, like, where it was trying to explain to Logan where it was at. And so, like, it was March. Th- it was, like, mission there. Yeah. It's like, all right. And so, like, we had been in the canyon enough. I kind of understood where the deer were at and where we needed to get to shoot. So we go hiking around. And all of a sudden, I spot the deer. Mm-hmm. And I was going to get you set up on the on the top of the, the canyon, on the rim, Dude, the wind was just howling yeah. at this point. And it, like, it, the day started out really calm and nice, um, but we knew there was a storm coming in. And by this point, it was probably 11.30 in the afternoon, uh, the wind picked up, and it was blowing. And so I grabbed the gun. I tried to initially set it up on the edge or on the top, and uh, we dove down into the canyon another 50 yards just to get out of the wind enough. Like, the wind was still blowing down the canyon, but it wasn't blowing Look directly at us where we were at yeah so we get set up i get the gun set up and in the previous days like when we thought about killing a deer i'd try to get like the bipod out get the gun on it get the gun on the deer mm-hmm. and you had mentioned like let me just get behind the gun yeah and so i just got the bipod out got the gun in mm-hmm. the in the clamp tightened it down and had it pointing in the direction of the deer 
and I was sitting next to you, and uh, you ended up finding the deer through the scope. Mm -hmm. And um, having some previous experience with shooting in the wind this year, uh, the 3378 is shooting 180 grain acupon, which is a fairly big bullet, and, but there is still some wind drift. And I, I was assuming the wind was coming down the canyon about 20 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, at 325 yards, I believe, 330 yards is what the shot was. Like, it's not far, but it's still going to affect it. And yeah. we had talked about shot placement a lot. I mm -hmm. think that's huge with new hunters, understanding, like, the the – what's inside of the deer and where you're trying to hit, right? Yeah. Like that's front shoulder. The lungs are going to be right behind it. Heart's going to be like right behind that shoulder, lower. Anyway, so I, we had walked through like where you wanted to aim at a deer, but the wind was blowing from our right to left, deer facing left, the buck. And I said like, instead of shooting right behind the shoulder, like go mid body, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so Kaylee was set up on the deer. Um, she found the, acquired the target herself with the wind blowing and the buck was kind of like behind some some bushes, um, intermixed with some does. And I was just trying to help, like, facilitate the best shot opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so, like, Kaylee was on it, though. I was like, can you see his horns? She's like, yes. And the deer had stepped out. I'm like, all right, he's going to turn. He turned. She weren't feeling comfortable. You mentioned in the video, like, the gun's shaky. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. What what was that? I can't remember now. Why was it just the wind that was making the gun feel shaky? Yeah, and it was that was on a bipod. Okay, because I felt very steady. It felt like a hectic moment, but still inside, I felt pretty calm. I felt like I felt like it was just important to feel one hundred percent comfortable. And I know that that's not always possible, but I was just like, okay, I need to feel really good. I need to feel good about his position because. I didn't want to injure him, and and so I I know I had a shot that you probably could have made, but I felt like he wasn't turned enough, so I just waited, and then he <laughs> turned perfect. Like it was just a perfect opportunity. Yeah. So at first, you know, he was in the bushes and behind some does, and he came out, and there was an opportunity there, but he was he was quartering away pretty hard, and you even said you're like I'm like all right, you can make that shot. We had talked about if he turns, you know, you mm -hmm. need to aim back and all that. Yeah. But you were like, I just feel like I'm going to hit him in the guts. Yeah. So you waited, and that was awesome. And then he was broadside for, a, like, a split second. I was like, all right, there. And then he turned. And I was like, no, no, no. And you're mm -hmm. like, I, I know, I know, I'm on him. Yeah. And then he turned, and you slowly squoze the trigger like you're supposed to do. Gun went off as a surprise. You can clearly see that in the video. And you absolutely just smoked that deer. Yeah, I think in, you know, those moments before waiting for him to turn, I just kept thinking, am I, am I going to do this? Am I really going to do this? And just so many emotions were going through my, you know, my mind. I don't know. I had so many thoughts. And then when he turned, I was just like, I, I think this feels right. So shoot the deer, um, me and Logan were on him with the spinos and the spotter. Mm -hmm. Deer goes down. I tried to get back on. Well, here's the thing. We had we had shot a few guns, or we had shot the guns, but I had those headphone things on, the noise blockers. Yeah. I didn't have those on, and I didn't even think about it in the moment. So the gun was so loud that it surprised me because I just – that was the last thing I was thinking about. So my ears were ringing – and then I was trying to get back on the scope and there was so much going on and I couldn't find, I couldn't find him. And then you were Logan said, he's down. And I was just flooded with so many emotions. Yeah. I think that, that moment of, you know, you pulling the trigger, making a terrific shot and then hearing, you know, me and Logan hooping and hollering when he died, you know, cause that's, Ultimately, as a sportsman, as an outdoorsman, as a hunter, that's exactly what you want. Mm -hmm. You want to inflict as least amount of pain on that animal as possible with him just dying mm -hmm. and not suffering, right? Yeah. And that's exactly what you did. Like, you couldn't have made a better shot. Like, he, that deer lived for maybe eight seconds after you squoze that trigger. Yeah. Perfect heart shot. Ran a few steps, died, literally on the run. Didn't even know what happens. Like, mm -hmm. that's what you're you're hoping for. Yeah. That's what you're, you know, practicing for all your life to hopefully be able to continually do that every year. 
And so you make the shot, you know he's down, and then you get flooded with those emotions. Yeah. And it's so hard, in my opinion, and going back to what I said earlier, like I don't know what it would be like if I would have just got into this at this age. Because mm-hmm. I think I understand more now. Yeah. As, as a kid, I don't think, you know, maybe you don't really – understand exactly what's going on you know that uh, you've seen your dad kill a deer and that provides meat and that's a good thing and you want to like experience that and so you do it and then it happens and you're just so thrilled but as an adult you understand and have a lot more in-depth perception of of life i Mm -hmm. guess especially being a parent or whatever it is but you understand those things and so i don't understand what that feeling was like for you yeah and it's hard to describe because I think, you know, also having spent five days watching these animals and knowing, like, I love animals, but now I love them even more. I love mule deer more than I thought that could ever be possible. I loved watching them. I truly enjoyed that. And knowing I just took the life of of one of them and this this buck that we watched for a long time and you know, that felt, that was big, you know, taking the life of an animal felt heavy, and I felt grateful, knowing that he was an older buck did make me feel, feel happy that he had lived a good life, it was exciting, there were just so many emotions, I can't, I can't really explain how I felt, but, but it felt like a lot. (laughs) I think, I think that's it. I think no matter where you're at in your life, if you start when you're a kid, if, you know, you, you had understanding of hunting like you did and then going out and doing it or whatever the case might be, like, I feel like the feelings might be different. The lead up to all that might be different, but in the moment, the reaction is very similar of what I've seen over the years from different people in different walks of life the reaction is is very similar in the fact of all those emotions that you have, and those emotions might be different for you than they were for me, but all those emotions culminating into that, into that moment. Mm -hmm. And it's exciting. It's sad. It's emotional, but it's all this thing that culminates. And after the fact, even during the fact, it's hard for you to explain. Yeah. And that's what I still feel today even having a very good knowledge of, you know, conservation of why the whys we hunt of, you know, it's our business, all those things. I still feel all those emotions coming to like this peak and it's still f- today for hard for me to explain. Yeah. But what I know is, and I told you this is that's it. Like I can see it and I'm like, that's it. That's, that's all the puzzle pieces finally coming together. Yeah. And especially you having the knowledge of enjoying eating that meat as much as we do now, of our kids enjoying that meat, like knowing that the herd is better because of what you just did. Mm -hmm. Like knowing all that, like that to me, that moment is the one thing that you cannot explain to anybody. You cannot show to anybody until they go and have that experience for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Truly. So wrapping this up, you realize we've been on here for two, almost two and a half hours. Yeah, I do. So, <laughs> and I appreciate you being on. And hopefully you guys at home have enjoyed this podcast. I wanted to kind of start it out with you know, a little backstory of, you know, I've told the story of Hush, but a big part of that story was Kaylee, obviously. And telling that and just kind of walking through the steps of where she was at, you know, marrying me 20 years ago and not really eating the meat until where we're at now. And now especially having her be on the hunt. Mm-hmm. Um, what I want, though, is just one question. I asked everyone yesterday, like, if you were to have one question for Kaylee, because the response from this video, it's been up for three or four days now. Like, the biggest overall response is that I've taken away is a lot of people have watched it with their wives mm-hmm. or with their girlfriends. And the overwhelming, con- like, question I'm, I'm seeing is how – does a husband or a boyfriend get their significant other involved in hunting? And the, like, I've seen it, the scenario, like she understands hunting, mm-hmm. she, you know, she, she grew up knowing what hunting was. She likes to eat the meat. 
Um, there's all these different scenarios, but at the end of the day, like in your opinion, how does a husband or a boyfriend go about in the best way getting their significant other out in the woods, either partaking in the hunting with a tag themselves or just being along for the hunt to kind of see it? Yeah, I think that you have to give your partner time. That's what I think it comes down to. I'm grateful for the time that it took me to get to this place because I appreciated everything. And so for me, I didn't, I've never felt pressure or expected to do anything except for what I felt was, was comfortable for me. And I'm grateful for that. Um, because like I said, I appreciated it more. I do think that I, I, do kind of wish that this this kind of contradicts what I said, but I do wish that I would have gone on a hunt maybe. I, I don't want to say I wish I would have, but maybe that would have helped me be more open to the possibility of being the hunter if I would have gone on a hunt or two before. Maybe Maybe this all would have happened sooner because I just enjoyed being out there so much. I enjoyed that process more than I thought that I ever would. Like I, I hope that I'm invited to go on another hunt just to be there with you or with the kids. Well, I think one of the most powerful things that I took away from it and after that moment of, you know, all those emotions culminating for you is, um, Logan and Cody went back to get the truck and we were talking. You're like, I want to be a part of this more. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'm not the hunter. Maybe I'm not the person that has the tag in their pocket but I wanted to be on a hunt with you and the kids. Like yeah. I want to, I want to help my kids out. I want to be there for them and I want to be involved in this more. And I thought that was a super powerful thing, not only because you just hunted mm -hmm. and taken, you know, all the steps and had gone through all the experiences, but you realized that it's such a profound thing. Hunting is. Yeah. After experiencing it from A to Z mm -hmm. is that, you loved it as enough to know that that's something that you would want to continue to do, even though you might not be the tag holder, you want to be there for your kids. Yeah. I want to enjoy that journey and I want to experience that journey. And I think, you know, when you're young, cause I, you know, I think when I explained like nature is just so amazing, it's cause I'm older. And I think when you get older, you appreciate those things more. Cause to my kids, I'm sure I'm just like dorky and old, <laughs> but I did. It was just so amazing. And, I would love to experience that with, with them. Yep. Even if I'm the dorky old mom. Well, there you uh -huh. go, guys. Um, I've said it uh, after experiencing, you know, getting kids involved in the outdoors, and I'm still not an expert at it by any means, but I do think my best advice for people trying to get their kids involved is, let, just like Kaylee said, just give them time. Like I always say, you just have to give them the opportunities. Mm -hmm. Give them the opportunity to go out on a hunt with you. Go Give them an opportunity to go on a camping trip with you. Like. Yeah. Take them out for an afternoon of fishing, whatever it might be. Just give them the opportunity to hopefully fall in love with the woods, whatever that might be. If it's on a hike, if it's on a, a family camping trip, if it's on a hunt, on a fishing trip, you just have to allow them to experience that for themselves mm -hmm. and make their mind up if that's something they want to do. Yeah, let that decision be theirs. And I think that's very important to, say, to go along with um, your significant other in your mm -hmm. life as well. It's no different. Give them the opportunity uh, know, let them know they're invited first off <laughs> and then give them the opportunity to hopefully go out and experience it for whatever, you know, how, whatever level they want. Um, if that's even just going out glassing in the summertime, trying to find some, some velvet bucks, yeah. like give them the opportunities to see enough and experience enough to make their mind up for themselves. If that's something they want to do and participate in. And I think if you do that at the end of the day, like, um, whatever their decision might be, like you gave them the very best opportunity to hopefully uh, choose one or the other, you know? Yeah. Yep. Well, thank you guys for sitting in and listening. This has been the longest podcast I've ever sat through, almost two and a half hours. <laughs> uh, babe, any that's closing? A, that's a long podcast. Any closing remarks? Well, I just want to say thank you to everyone. I have read the comments and I appreciate, I appreciate the things that people did share in the comments. It, I have cried so much you know watching the video again reading the comments people talking about 
memories that it brought back, experiences that they've had hunting with their partner. It was just, it's just a really amazing community and, and I've been very grateful for that. So thank you. I love it. Yeah. We've gotten some really good feedback, um, from the video. And like I said, um, you know, seeing Kaylee going out and experiencing this is probably something I didn't know I wanted. Yeah. I didn't know there was, I think there was some years there. I didn't know if I wanted you to be a right, hunter. It was like, this is your thing. It's kind of my thing. Like, you know, I can go do my thing and come back and we yeah. can just have a, us, you know? Well, we also both work from home, so sometimes it's nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's no doubt about that. But uh, <laughs> after experiencing that with you, it's something I definitely want to have you, you know, do as much as you want to do. Like, come with us, me and the kids, or mm -hmm. if you want to go and shoot another deer or an elk, mm -hmm. maybe put in for a moose this year. I don't I, know. I was just telling Casey I wanted to get really good at shooting a bow. Maybe an archery elk kind of nature. I don't know, but it's definitely something I didn't know I wanted until I experienced that with you, and that's something I definitely would like to do more. And uh, for you guys at home, um, just give your significant other the opportunity to hopefully fall in love with it and, and at least experience it, and they will make their mind up uh, at the end of the day if it's something they want to do. But thank you guys for listening. As always, um, we're going to try to be more consistent with these, guys, with these podcasts. So if you guys have some feedback – Definitely from here on out, we're going to try to film them. Um, that was the feedback we got in yesterday's vlog I asked. A uh, majority of people would love to have an audio and video. And if we do have both, you don't have to watch it. You can always download it wherever you download your favorite podcast and just have the audio. But I like watching a podcast. I like watching facial expressions. You guys didn't know this because there's not videos. I don't even have pants on. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They're on my head. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we're going to try to film these moving forward. And uh, if you guys have any guests you would like to ask, try to get on uh, let us know in the comments but as always guys thanks for you for the support thank you for watching the video of experience if you haven't go and watch it now it'll be linked down below and uh guys we'll see you next time thank you bye